Good morning. Welcome to the October 18, 2018 Public Health Nursing Webinar. My name is Joy Hoskins. I'm the Director of Nursing for the Department for Public Health and the Division Director for Women's Health. So thank you so much for being able to join us today. I know this is a busy time of the year for you all with um, influenza, uh, mass vaccination clinics, and uh, many of you all are also providing uh, through your communities hepatitis A vaccine, and we appreciate all of that work. This information that's provided today for those uh, of your staff who may not be able to join us because they're out of the clinic uh, will be uh, archived and available via an archived webcast within a couple of days. And I'll be sure to let everyone know so they could access this the information that's provided today. The first speaker that we have is Dr. Julie Watts McKee. Julie is the state dental director for the entire state. Um, she works in the division of maternal and child, Ch maternal and child health, excuse me. And she's going to give us a, a great overview and an update about the status of oral health in Kentucky. So um, you should have her presentation uh, available to you. And um, because of the APRN conference, that was Tuesday and Wednesday, I am uh, running behind on getting out all the handouts. So, but I do feel confident that you have Dr. McKee. So um, I'll, I'll continue to uh, send out the other presentations that I received uh, while I was out of the office this, uh, earlier this week. So Dr. McKee, if you'd like to come up. And Dr. McKee also is uh, double billing. She was she should receive <laughs> double billing recognition because she spoke at the APRN conference uh, for me on for us on Tuesday. So uh, she's been she's been a, a willing provider uh, to get in front of the camera in front of uh, a group of about 80 APRNs uh, yesterday and Tuesday. So thank you, Dr. McKee, for your uh, for graciously agreeing to speak twice this week for us. Okay, good morning to everybody out there. I appreciate y'all being with us this morning. Um, today, I'm really not gonna talk about coding numbers. I'm not gonna be talking about um, the actual uh, uh, billing problems that you might be having with some of your, your varnish. We're gonna talk about more of the theology and the religion of oral health in Kentucky. Um, we're gonna talk about Kentucky's strategic plan for oral health um, and how do I? Um, you should just go one click. Yeah. Okay. All right. We just finished okay. doing actually our first annual update of our plan for oral health. And we're going to go back for you all on how this really came to be for the current strategic plan. In 2006, Dr. Jim Cecil, who is my predecessor, he got together a lot of people, a lot of people, and developed their first strategic oral health plan. It may not have been their first ever, but it was the first that actually brought in outside stakeholders that um, that might be interested in uh, promoting oral health and oral health programs throughout the state. Back then, in 2006, these were the um, these were the the priorities that they came up. They wanted to increase the number of dental professionals to underserved areas to assure access to care for everybody. Everybody who wants to see a dentist could see a dentist. They wanted to increase and sustain funding for oral health programs. I'm all about that. They wanted to recognize stakeholder involvement to expand the awareness of education in oral health and that they wanted to promote the fact that oral health should be a full component of coordinated, integrated, and comprehensive services. Go back to the recognized stakeholder involvement, expand awareness and education. It's really interesting, and I can say this because I'm a dentist, so I can talk about dentists, maybe not in the, the best of light. Um, dentists are an unusual group, and they're a wonderful group. But they think, and they still think to a point, even though we are breaking down some of those misconceptions, that oral health and dentistry are the same subset of each other. And it's taken a long time, and some of them still don't get it, that oral health 
has a component of dentistry, but it's not all dentistry. And what I do is I give them some test questions on, okay, so if you want to do all oral health, are you going to do screenings at your school? Well, no. Are you going to check the water plant to make sure that the fluoride is at optimal level and help them fix it if it's not? Well, no. Are you going to work to try to get another comp a competitor in your town because your town needs it as far as dent a dentist? Well, no. So it's questions like this that help them understand that dentistry is an incredibly important part of oral health, but oral health is all of us. So we decided, well, we did, I didn't decide. Um, it was decided that we needed to update our oral health plan. It was 11 years old at the time. And what it was is um, the Kentucky Youth Advocates, believe it or not, they have something they come out every December. And it's called the Blueprint for Kentucky's Children, and that is their legislative agenda. Well, lo and behold, one of those agenda items was we need a strategic, a strategic plan for oral health, and we also need a surveillance system to see what's going on in oral health so we can have a good strategic plan. And they were going to take it to the legislature. They had even uh, lined up uh, a sponsor for the bill. And the Bevin administration said, wait a minute, this is something we ought to be doing anyway. Let's go ahead and do it. You don't need the legislation for it to happen, and we'll make it happen. So uh, through that, through the, the then uh, secretary and through Eric Clark, we developed the strategic plan for oral health, the outline to get it done so that um, it wasn't, it didn't have to go through the legislative process and, and all that stuff. This is honestly part of the Bevins administration on the red tape reduction initiative. And that was just one way we could um, get the outcome and still not have to go through the law and the regulations and the forms and the extended uh, calendar that it had. So what we found out, well, we had a stakeholder meeting and we invited everybody in the world there was one requirement that you had to have if you had a mouth you were a stakeholder so we had people come from yes the dental world the education world the social work world um we had a uh, public school represented we had hygienists represented we had fqhc's represented it was a nice it was a nice uh, uh cross-section of everybody who had mouths in the state of kentucky we started talking and we found out that what was old is still with us. We we're still seeing a problem with childhood dental decay. We really don't know the quantitative because we haven't had a survey for a while, but we know it's an issue. We see it every day in our children. We still have dentally underserved areas, places that do not have a dentist. And we'll look at some maps in a minute that it's places that do not have a Medicaid dentist. And with most children, it's not a huge majority, but it's about 52% of Kentucky's children being covered by Medicaid. That's an issue in some of our areas of the state. We, we might have enough dentists in Kentucky. We're not really sure, but here's what we do know. We have a maldistribution of dentists, and we'll see a map about that in just a minute too. Insurance coverage, it gets wonky by the year. In the private sector, um, we are paying, we, the population, are paying more in premiums, the monthly premiums, but the maximum benefit annually has stayed the same for the past 30 years. Your, your premiums have probably since maybe 1980 have gone up three or four fold, whereas your annual benefit May it still limits itself at $1,000 or $1,500. That doesn't buy much in retail dentistry these days. We see changes in Medicaid coverage, and we're still undergoing those as we speak. With the uh, 1115 waiver, we're really not sure what's going to happen relative to adult dental coverage. Children's dental coverage will not change. They are not messing with that, so that's good. We're still seeing a problem with the funding of state and local oral health programs. Never enough money. Here's one of those maps I was telling you about. This is a distribution of Kentucky's dentists throughout, and each dot is a dentist. 
And um, our epidemiologist, Lindsay Matters, made this map. But if you look at it, you can kind of fuzz your eyes and you can see the, the centers of commerce of our state. You can see Jefferson County, dot, 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 everywhere. You can see Cincinnati, the, the southern Cincinnati area, lots of dots there. I was surprised at how few dots you see in central Kentucky because central Kentucky is a pretty populated area. You can kind of look and see Ashland, you can look and see in Paducah, and then there's Bowling Green and Owensboro. But, <clears throat> excuse me, what really concerns me as a public health person, as the state dental director that works on distribution of health professionals, you can see that there are places in Kentucky that don't have a whole lot of dots, but they have people. So you can look, look at Breathitt County. Mm -hmm. There's one at the very corner, and I think they since closed their office since this was, this is almost two years old now, a year and a half, a year and a half old. But there are people all over that area, in the Appalachian area. You can see around the Campbellsville area, that's a little, that's a little thin too. You move over to Western Kentucky, and Western Kentucky has as much of a need for dentists as Eastern Kentucky does. It's really interesting to see that. You can see Paducah, you can kind of see um, um, Hopkinsville. If you drop your eyes past the state line, you can see how many dentists claim a Kentucky license that are actually at uh, Fort Campbell. So we have a maldistribution of dentists. Um, and even in those areas, we see, a, we call them dental deserts, go figure. Uh, we see dental deserts in West Louisville. We see dental deserts in northern Fayette County. As lush and prosperous as we think those areas are, we do have a, a access problem. We have um, dental deserts in the more urban areas of northern Kentucky and Newport and Covington. Uh, when you get out into the suburbs, you can see dentists everywhere, but right down in that, that urban area, we don't have as many as we, we could. So we do need more dentists and we need more dentists in areas of of population. Doctor, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask about Medicaid dentists. And you're, okay. You're one step ahead. Joy was wondering about Medicaid dentists and <laughs> voila, look what we've got. <laughs> this is a map that I think is very telling um, of our Medicaid dentist. Let me tell you right now, we do not in any county in our state have enough general dentists, and let's go ahead and put oral surgeons in there, um, dentists that accept Medicaid for both children and adults. We, do, we, do, we just don't. But, and the thing is, is believe it or not, only about 25% of our general dentists are what we call regular Medicaid providers. The rest of them are either, heck no, I do not have even a provider license, or some of them have a provider license, and they're what I call an accidental de, uh, Medicaid provider. Oh, by the way, little Julie has a medical card, and they go ahead and bill it, but they never they never knew about it. So we call those accidental. They have three, four claims a year. About 25% of uh, uh, licensed dentists do accept Medicaid, and only about 15% total. So it'd be about 45% of that. 25% regularly take it. But you can look at this map and you can see that these, this is not a dot to dot thing like the last one, but this is a ratio, a ratio of Medicaid providers, dentists to Medicaid patients. And it goes all the way, for example, you can see with the little bitty um, writing at the bottom, you can see that Bath County, which is in, if there was a north, <laughs> northeastern Kentucky, it's almost there. Um, uh, just uh, a little bit north of Montgomery and Menifee, Bath County has 5,770 Medicaid patients for every one Medicaid dentist that is in that town. That's incredible. That's, that's serious overwork. And then on the flip side, you have Fayette County, and Fayette County has one dentist for every 321 Medicaid patients, which makes access to care if you can get to the office pretty easy to do. Now, one thing that we cannot calculate with any type of um, equation uh, population-based equation, but we have to recognize in the state of Kentucky is we have, I, I mentioned them before, centers of commerce that um, I grew up in Anderson County. 
And my mom thinks that there is no worthy doctor unless you go to Fayette County. So we go to Fayette County for all of our doctorate. And uh, so, but people go to a center of commerce for other reasons too. Um, I live in Georgetown and I, I ran the Waco District Health Department for a while. And Scott County was, was considered the center of commerce, not only for one of our counties, Harrison County, but actually for a uh, more remote county, Nicholas County. They would go to, that's where they went to uh, get their doctoring, to uh, get their nails done, to make sure the kids had shoes for school. That was all done. So we have to recognize that, that we don't have quite the, um, the equation for. So when you see dentist, excuse me, when you see counties that don't have a dentist at all, I'm not too worried about that. Um, Robertson County doesn't have a dentist but everybody goes to Maysville. It's really no big deal. They've got good roads there. Um, Edmondson County doesn't have a, 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 a dentist or they, they didn't, but people there go to Glasgow or Bowling Green with, with that. And a lot of it happens um, to go to Paducah in the purchase area. But with the, um, so that doesn't bother me, but the Medicaid bothers me. And you can almost see a, a dark red ribbon across that, the Southern part of Kentucky there we'd like to change that and um we've got some ideas how but we don't know exactly what it's going to take okay so why not just stick with if you find all that other stuff in the 2006 just stick just put a stamp on it and say we've updated and just use that well we really can't because there's been some changes in dentistry we have new trends emerging we have extended providers in kentucky and i'll talk a bit about it we have that public health dental hygienist out there now we've got new trends we have public health nurses doing varnishes that wasn't happening much in 2006 so we we have new providers outside kentucky we have dental therapists that are providing care to especially children that are a new type of provider. We have new dental materials and techniques. The silver diamine fluoride is not new, but it's new to us. We have new filling materials. We have new radiograph uh, techniques. We have just new, a lot of, a lot of things, new um, injection techniques that, that help us out. Another thing is since 2006, all of us, just not as public health people, are really more attuned and in tune with population-based activities, the fluoridation of water, sealants on kids, um, health education for the masses. So they are more in tune with that, and that's a good thing. Medicaid coverage is still an issue, but it's changing all the time. Like I said, we're really not sure what the 1115 waiver is gonna hold for our Medicaid population, uh, the, the adults. We have a shift in delivery of care that we've seen actually since 2006. We, some people start their um, dental experience with that public health nurse. Maybe they started with a public health hygienist. We were seeing places of care being uh, shifted to corporate dentistry, the Aspen, the um, small smiles or cool smiles or, or whatever. That's a shift in delivery of care. We're seeing less sole proprietorship of dentists really big and more group practices and shared practices and three and four way partnerships. Thank goodness we're seeing a little bit more integration of care between the medical professional and the dental professional. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because that is a personal drum for me to be to see if we can shift the needle just a little bit on that. One of the things that was on the mind of most of our stakeholders, be it a dentist, a community member or what, is the incredible cost of dental education. In Kentucky, as an in-state student, in between our two dental schools, and they're not that much far off as far as this particular value, but after four years, the average student graduates with a student educational debt of $237,000. That is massive. When I was in dental school, I, I thought the world was coming down on me because it was $20,000. But that's a, big, that's a big deal, and that comes into play directly when we try to place dentists in, 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 in areas of need. Now, there's no test on this slide. There's no test on any of this, but there's no test on the slide. And this is not exactly how I drew it to begin with, but mine was too busy and too confusing. But what it is, is we had, when we did our strategic plan, we divided into eight groups, data collection and metrics, policy, oral health literacy, the workforce, dentistry as a business, which is different than the workforce, 
interprofessional co collaboration, which I talked about just a minute ago, um, emerging issues like that silver diamine fluoride, like the the um, the the dental uh, therapist, and prevention. Prevention should always be part of our, our our focus groups. But this, the original one showed that every group talked about the blue squares on this on this slide. So inter Professional collaboration also talked about performance measures and how they could help the screening law be done better. You know, um, the emerging issues talked about professional credentialing and how that happens and how you can or cannot be a specialist in what you want to be. And they also talked about silver diamond chloride. So I'm just going to go over some of the key points of some of our focus groups. And, and if we have time, if you have some questions and I haven't completely put you to sleep or you've gone to get coffee or whatever, um, we, we can do that. But I'm just going to focus on some. Oral health literacy, that's big. And that's a big public health thing, too, because we can do something about that. And what the focus was is educating everyone on the dental needs of the population, not just the people that you feel have low literacy altogether, low health literacy, but everybody. We need to educate our legislators on how oral health impacts all of us. It impacts education, it impacts business, it impacts industry and growth and planning. We need to educate our Board of Health members. I ran a health department. They, it was amazing what they did not know about oral health and oral public health, dental public health. We need to focus on dentists. We need to help train them to talk to their patients so their patients can make good decisions, give them options on it. Uh, sometimes the dentists try to impress themselves by using quarter words, and sometimes it just does not work. So, um, and that's a little bit of a, of, of a dicey piece of ground to walk on is to help dentists communicate better because they think they do it pretty well anyway. And other policymakers that come down the road, including our leadership, our, our commissioner, um, um, to have them understand exactly why oral health is part of overall health and it should be included in all health planning. We need to, uh, we, they talked about the importance of oral health literacy across the lifespan. We're not doing a bad job, we could always do better, we're not doing a bad job of engaging the young parents or the parents of young children, but we need to talk about, about over the lifespan, what to expect in your mouth when you're 18, when you're 40, when you're 64. One of the to-do list on my bucket list is to try to have a, a educational campaign to, believe it or not, pre-retirees, not just a state employees and public employees, but everybody, because once they retire, there's no more dental benefit. So what we want to do is try to encourage them to get as perfect as possible so that when they move into their retirement years and they have lesser benefits or no dental benefits, they're at a maintenance phase rather than a real rehabilitative phase or a disease control phase. So oral health is important from conception to three days before your funeral, and we're trying to address that. Interprofessional dental and medical collaboration. I love this one. I do. It's really interesting because when I was in dental school back in the Bronze Age, a couple of dinosaurs left, but not many, um, we were taught that there was a systemic impact of oral health on uh, premature birth, cardiovascular disease, stroke risk, diabetes, and arthritis. So I'll get out of school, nobody knows that. Doctors don't know it, but we know it. And all of those have been proven until, well, all of them except arthritis, and now arthritis is now, why, why shouldn't it be? It, it um, impacts a lot of other autoimmune diseases, so it should. We want the dentist to become part of that primary care team. I was so impressed when a friend of mine was um, readying up for a uh, knee replacement. And the, when you do this, apparently, I, I'm lucky and blessed, thank you, Lord, for having all my joints. I'm recently missing a gallbladder. Good riddance. Um, she had a checklist of everything, everything she had to do. And, you know, she had to get clearances and blah, blah, blah. One of the things that was like, do not call to schedule a surgery until you have clearance from your dentist that you are in a maintenance phase and that your gums are in good good shape. And she's like on a Facebook messenger, why do I need to do this? 
and I, I explained it. She said, oh, okay. Because the bugs that cause periodontal disease and even periodontal inflammation enter our bloodstream. We want to present a body that has low risk of rejection. And those bugs will find any new piece of material, uh, pure, uh, foreign matter, and hang on to it. So that's why we want to have those gums in good shape for no, not only that, but we're seeing a shift in organ transplants. It used to be that if you had any dental disease whatsoever, whatsoever, they did full mouth extractions before they would do a heart lung transplant. And we know that that's unnecessary. So we want that dentist to be part of that primary care. We want dentists to be able to pull A1Cs to maybe diagnose diabetes in an earlier uh, um, stage. Um, public health is all about early intervention. Well, wouldn't that be great? Um, I worked with a hygienist that um, um, predicted or diagnosed two pregnancies through, how, through the, the changes in the gums. It's like, oh, you're pregnant. No, I'm not. Yeah, you call me in a week. And sure enough, they were. So we want that because that, that gave her the opportunity to say, we need to for you to get care during your pregnancy because we want you to have a good outcome on, on births. And oral health is part of that. Prevention. It was talked over and over again about the expansion of the public health hygienist, both in geography, in our footprint, and in scope of practice. Um, one of the things we're trying to do with the, the uh, Board of Dentistry is to have them recognize that it is within, fully within the scope of practice for a public health hygienist to apply that silver diamine fluoride to arrest decay and get these people to a dentist. I'm all for it. To try to change the other's mind, that is going to be a bit, bit of a challenge. We'd like to see health departments more and more have a public health hygiene program. Sadly, and I'm very disappointed that's not happening. And remember we talking about the Kentucky Youth Advocates Blueprint for Kentucky's Children and their legislative agendas. One of the legislative agendas is going to be we want to expand the public health hygiene program not to not to ban it from health departments, but include other opportunities, specifically the, those federally qualified health centers to have a plan. Um, I can't fight it because we don't have any other uh, health departments that are interested in growing and um, establishing a program. If I'm supposed to be here to make sure kids and everybody get care when they could, I can't buck this, but I sure would like for it to be. The reason that I, I, I'm hesitant about this is my own personal problem from being a control freak. One of the things that I like about our um, health department based hygiene program is 92% of the kids who need care get care in their hometown. That's huge. That's huge. Um, that's our referral rate. We thought we'd have about a 75%. It's 92%. We don't care who they go to as long as they go to a dentist. We work to get them in. We make sure that they have transportation and, and, and call the dentist for them. I'm not convinced that this level of referral, which gets the kids out of the disease state, will happen with that. Even though if it is an FQHC, they have a place to refer them to. They can refer them to their own dental clinic. I just don't know if they'll, if they'll do the follow-up work, which is very expensive. Prevention, silver diamine fluoride. How am I doing on time? You're doing great. On okay. Silver diamine fluoride, it, okay, is a water is a watercolored colorless. Well, it's blue now, but it is a solution that when you apply to shallow to moderate cavities, it stops the decay process in its tracks, and not only does that, it stops the pain related to that decay process. It it buys the patient time to be able to get to a dentist to see uh, if the tooth should be filled. And, and have it filled. We'd like to see that being expanded. I, I trained the, um, the APRNs about it. I don't know how far that's going to go, but they, they listened um, to it. But that, that is, it, it's an old solution that has made it into America again. Um, we have a training program ready to go for anybody, dentist, hygienist under a dentist purview, or hopefully the public health hygienist will be able to do it. It's a great, it's not a cure-all, but it is a great placeholder and time holder for when you can get to the dentist.
We want to create consistent oral health messages and education in health departments. That'd be great. I'd love, I would love to have the staff that is a communication specialist. And all they do every day, all day, is develop tested um, messages for us and for health departments and whoever wants to, schools, to be able to give consistent, effective messaging to let people know about the value of oral health across that lifespan that we talked about earlier. They also wanted to review the school pre-entry screening requirements, that thing that's the sheet of paper that, do you have a kid? Yes. Do they have teeth? Yes. Do they have holes? Yes. You know, that, that screening requirement. That requirement, the problem with that requirement is that as wonderful as it sounds, and it's a good thing, is it has no, excuse me, teeth in it. It has no penalty clause. If the parent doesn't do it, if a school doesn't report it, it's no big deal. So that being that most schools do record and report some type of activity relative to screening, but still only between 52 and 54 percent of all the children going into public school receive that oral health screening. And that oral health screening can be done by a myriad of people, including you as public health nurses. That's what you do as part of the fluoride varnish anyway. You're just recording it and giving it back to mom. So we're going to look at that to see if we can do better, maybe get a sponsor to strengthen it a little bit so that the kids who are found needing urgent care are uh, moved to care in their hometown rather than just saying, oh, you got a big fat abscess, go take your seat. That's not good. That's not good policy. That's not good public health. I showed you that huge, messy, messy um, graph that that each of those eight, P, eight um, groups talked about everything and how it crisscrossed. But we kept hearing the same thing, themes from all of those groups. And here's what we heard in all or most of them. The need for data and metrics. It used to be not too many years ago, only the public health people really cared about data and metrics because why would anybody else use them? So we, we measure and we report and we analyze and we train as much as possible. Well, data and metrics has become such a buzzword that now everybody wants it. The schools want them. Um, the um, uh, private dentists, go figure. They want to know what's going on in, in their own county so they can promote or advertise or create a policy of their own practice that meets that need of the county. Private industry is using them. When I ran Webco, I had a, um, uh, an epidemiologist that was employed by Toyota. They employed their own epidemiologist. And what he was doing is he was gathering health statistics for Scott County in Kentucky, not to um, build a benefit package for Scott County in Kentucky and Toyota, because that's, that's done done. But they were building a plan in Texas. And so what he would do is he would take our stats and our in his benefit package or Toyota's benefit package and um, conjure them up over to the statistics found in in Texas. You know, if they had the same rate of cardiovascular disease, then it'll probably cost them this much in cardiovascular health benefits. So and, and he called it one of the one of the uh, standards he wanted is he wanted to know the decay rate of the preschool children in that area. Well, we happened to have it at that time. And I said, why, why would you need that? He said, that tells us um, dental values in that area. If we have a low decay rate, not only is everybody, other children have a low decay rate because they're being cared for, but the adults are taking care of them themselves, which means we'll have a lower out-of-pocket on Toyota's end for dental insurance, which we want to include. So I thought that was very interesting. So we're all about data and metrics all the time. So um, that's good for me, yay. And so we'd love to be able to put in place a sustainable, um, robust uh, surveillance system that measures a different population every year for five years, and then back on year six, you go back to year one and measure them again. We think we can get a lot of data out of that, but it just takes money, honey. In all the groups, the expansion of that public health hygienist, both in scope and in geography, was talked about everybody, including the dentistry as a business, which is very business-focused, private private dentist-focused. They were interested in getting them because they realized that that improves their um, their patient pool by the public health dentist, uh, excuse me, the public health hygienist referring them to their hometown practice. People talk a lot about the um, 
incredible cost of, of dental, dental education. And they wanted to work to have incentives that would help encourage service in underserved populations. Tax incentives. They, the, the Kentucky Dental Association has a pretty unique um, uh, plan to present to lawmakers on tax incentives to like if you take so much Medicaid, you get a tax credit or a tax um, deduction. If you see um, an unserved population otherwise, you would get a tax dedu a deduction or credit. But they're they're very they're very um, cagey, and I say that in a good way. Very inventive on what they want that to look like. In this a decade ago, that may have not sounded good, but now with um, tax incentives coming from tax cuts and tax incentives coming from the federal government and the state government, maybe it's time to talk about it again. A loan repayment program. They are talking about how that, well, studies show that any healthcare provider, nurse, dentist, physician, whatever, if they stay in an area for loan repayment for between four and five years, they'll stay for 25 years. That helps everybody. So if we could have a loan repayment program that put dentists in areas of need, paid them $50,000 a year for four years, that wipes out 75% of their, their debt um, tax-free. You don't have to pay income tax on that. And if they stay that four or five years, they've established a family, a social circle, a faith community, they'll stay for a long time and that would be great. Sustainable funding. Sustainable funding not only for uh, my programs, which yes, I'm selfish about, but other programs that, that touch us, including Medicaid and Medicaid administrative costs that could help us educate or case manage more care. Interesting, if you look at this list of of the key themes, data and metrics, expansion of that public health hygienist, incentives to serve under underserved populations, sustainable funding across the road. Another thing they talked about a lot was the establishment of a soda tax. Now, to put a new tax in, people put up their silver cross in front of them and say, please go away. But maybe it's time to think about it. Um, I've done some number crunching, and I, I call it uh, cocktail napkin calculations because that's pretty much what it was. But I, I did do some research and um, population-based research and soda habits. Kentucky Kentuckians consume more than one billion cans of soda a year. One billion. It's amazing. Uh, with that, if you take the that billion cans and you knock off, and we can find out, we found out how much you can knock off. The soda that's paid for by uh, food stamps, pooey, um, because they would not be taxed. But you can find out exactly how much revenue you could get. If Kentucky just put two cents a can, now I know we've got big gulps and whatever, but just average it. Everybody knows what a can is. If you have two cents a can uh, going to soda tax, the public health program could fund not only the programs we have, we could put a, a public health hygiene team in every um, health department and multiples in bigger ones when, when needed. We could, um, we could fund a loan repayment pay program for eight students at each of our universities every year to come back and get underserved areas and that would make a big, big difference. We would um, be able to not have that tax incentives, but it would it would pay it would pay for other public health um, health programs, fitness, walking, things like that. It would pay for that. If you had a rate of ten cents a can, between ten and twelve cents a can, we Kentuckians could fully fund the state's obligation for the state match of Medicaid. Not, you know, not what the federal, but we still get the federal money, but we could take care of ours. And that's been tested. Arkansas has done that. 13 years ago, they put a soda tax on their um, sodas and um, they fund their Medicaid. It's a trust fund and they have millions of dollars left over every year in order for them to have a rainy day fund in, the ever, in case they ever quit. Arkansas and Kentucky have lots of um, similar demographics. 
They have Little Rock, we have Louisville. They have Fayetteville, we have Lexington. They have a similar higher education system than we do. They've got mountains and they've got flats. We have mountains and we have flats. The level of education across the state is very similar. Incomes are similar. So it's a good benchmark for us to say, hmm, could we do that too? Well, time will tell. Nobody, everybody wants a soda tax. Nobody wants to light the torch and leave the crowd. So if you're a torch lighter, let me know. So what do we do now? What do we do now? We actually, because we involve stakeholders, remember qualification, anyone with a mouth, because we involve stakeholders, the stakeholders also have a responsibility to the plan. We're going to work on our common focal points. We still are engaging our dental schools, the Oral Health Coalition, the Kentucky Primary Care Association, the health departments, our school systems, the, um, the uh, superintendents. We're all, we're all involved in all those points of what we want to do. We're going to update it annually. Actually, we just had our first annual update uh, last September, and we got rid of some stuff and we added some stuff, but not much, not much at all. Um, it's not on our website yet because our website is still going up, but it should be on the website soon. If you are burning to know what uh, we have to do um, and what we're going to do and how you might be a part of it, give me, give me an email and I'll shoot you an electronic copy of what we've got going on. But we are going to update it annually with our stakeholders. I'm kind of excited about that. Um, Joy has stepped out and I really don't know how to open it up for questions, so I don't know what to do. Oh, let's see if we can get back there. I used to put this on here, and I don't know why I don't have it on here, but my email is J-U-L-I-E-W dot M-C-K-E-E -E at K-Y dot gov. And that's it. I feel kind of stuck here. Can you all open up the mics and ask? I don't, I don't know how this works. Oh, well, what else can I talk about? Um, one of the things that is uh, seems to be swirling around is uh, fluoridation, community water fluoridation. Uh, I just did an interview with NBC News, and they just did an article on it. If you want to go to NBCNews.com and find fluoridation, just click on that. It gives a big overview on why people hate it and why people love it. Um, fluoridation was developed... Um, back in, well, it was developed at the turn of the last century, but by the time that they did the studies and everything, it wasn't uh, fully accepted by municipal water systems until the mid-40s. Actually, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I do have a point to this. I'm just trying, not trying to use time. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan started a five-year project to see if it really did reduce decay in their children because they were um, uh, concerned with that. And after three years, they, they called off the pilot project because the results were so, so uh, impressive and reducing decay over three years by 50%. So with that, a lot of people um, got on the bandwagon and started fluoridating through systems. And outside Kentucky, fluoridation is a system by system um, decision. The city of San Francisco decides themselves if they want to fluoridate. Um, the town of um, Athens, Georgia, decides whether they want to fluoridate or not. In Kentucky, we have a state law that unless you are a teeny weeny little system, 1,500 miles or less, um, you have to fluoridate according to the CDC's regulations. They recently lowered them because when it was one part per million, we didn't have stannous fluoride in, um, in toothpaste and we didn't have act mouthwash and we didn't have a whole lot of uh, fluoridation going on from outside sources, and now we do. So the CDC has level, leveled it off to 0.7 parts per million. We see um, anti-fluoridationists all over the country really fight, really fight to get fluoride out of the water. They feel that um, a, a lot of things, one thing, they, they feel like it causes a myriad of um, health problems, everything from psoriasis to cancers, to autism, to lower IQ. Um, it doesn't. There were some issues about a brittle, brittle bone. Does it cause brittle bones? And that research, although the research is accurate, 
The application in the United States is not. The research is overseas in India, in Pakistan, in China, where their parts per million aren't 0.7, they're like 30 parts per million. So it's not applicable in the United States, but they still hang on to it. Um, but they're making headway town by town across America to get rid of this. They also feel like fluoridation, if it's good for our health, then it's a prescriptive medication and don't prescribe the population something if, if it's a prescription. They call it mass prescriptive authority and they don't like that. Um, but it does reduce decay between 40 and 50 percent and it's studied over and over again. I'm an incredibly huge fluoride proponent um, within the guidelines and not to over fluoridate. We have a problem sometimes with mommies that want to be super mommies and their children, by golly, will never have a cavity. And not only do they have city fluoridated water, they also have supplements that they add so they over fluoridate their own child. Right now, the outcome of that is something called mild fluorosis, completely cosmetic, looks like snowflake on the teeth. Those snowflake areas are actually quite um, uh, resistant to decay. So um, there was a bill filed in the last session to um, quit fluoridation. It went nowhere. I, it was assigned to a committee because all bills are assigned to a committee, but it went nowhere. But the city of Cynthia has uh, bought into this fluoride is bad for you and makes us dumb situation. So we don't want that miseducation to get out. Fluoride is good and it's safe. It reduces decay. And um, as you know from our training, that decay is the, by far, by far, the most common communicable chronic disease of childhood that we have. So, and Joy's still not back. So here we go. Let's see. 10, 19, I'm supposed to talk for 10 more minutes. Get your questions ready if they, if they don't. The phone says 10, 19. So here's what I'm going to do, and I just don't know what else to do. If you all could be back here at 1030, adjust your watches. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute program. I'll still be back here at 1030 in case you've got questions to go on. I just don't know how to do it. But let's take a break for 10 minutes, and then I think Joy's got some questions, and we'll get it from her. I'm so sorry about this. So the clock says 1019 when the clock says 1030. We'll be back. <laughs> I don't know. Betty told me to take a 10 minute break. And I'm talking out. If you want to go ahead and unbreak it, you can. Are we muted? Do I? No, I don't know how to mute it. Hey, everyone, just hang in there. And we'll. I told him I'd be back because I don't even know how to ask the questions. Um, I sort of do. Hi, everyone. <laughs> they may not hear you because I told them to take a break. <laughs>
Good morning. We're back. I apologize for the slight delay and the technical difficulty. Um, thank goodness uh, I have Jamie Bennett here to help me from Education Workforce Development uh, or else we wouldn't have any webinars at all. So um, thank you so much uh, for your patience and your tolerance. Uh, Dr. McKee, we ended uh, and you had you had ended and I wanted to give you the opportunity to answer any questions mm -hmm. that you may have or anything. Did you get to wrap up your entire uh, presentation? I, I, okay. I wrapped it up. But if okay. you have questions, I want to Yes, them. absolutely. So let's start. And just to make sure, I want to give Dr. McKee her full time. If there's our questions for those of y'all who were able to participate, um, please ask those now. And then Benita Decker, the 
a program director for the Adolescent Health and Family Planning Programs, is here to do an Adolescent Health Update with a Spark presentation, and she's right here next to us, so we'll get her on camera in just a moment. But are there any McKee, uh, <clears throat> questions for Dr. McKee before I um, let her go? <laughs> okay. Right. If you do have questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. McKee directly. And um, I know she's always uh, readily available and responsive to local health department questions and comments. So next, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to introduce Benita Decker again. And uh, Benita was also with me at, at my old Kentucky home Tuesday and Wednesday. So thank you, Benita, for being here with us today. Thanks, Joy. <clears throat> uh, so, hey, everybody. Um, I, as you know, I did two months ago, I did a SPARC. Um, it's a, a program initiative from the Adolescent Health Institute at the University of Michigan. They have lots of these SPARCs, little um, short, um, powerful trainings that, um, that really pack a punch. And so as at least probably about every other month at, at our um, webinars, um, we're going to present those because they're quick and easy, um, and they are um, they are very informative, powerful trainings as you work with youth. And so um, today's uh, one two months ago was on being adolescent friendly in your clinic. Um, today is about being strength based and the strength based approach strength based approaches um, to sexual health as you talk to your teens. Um, so um, as you know, if you remember from if you were on. Um, Two months ago, this is mostly interactive. This one's not quite as interactive as the um, last one, but toward the end, as we look at some case studies, I'm gonna need you to respond. So the way you'll do that is in your question box. So I'll kind of give you a warning about that, but be ready to um, be typing and um, get ready to answer as we go. A lot of this will be some, um, through the first part of this presentation will be um, and a reflective that if there's others in the room with you, you might want to talk to them about. But toward the end, I'm going to need you to respond as we can look at everyone as we have a, as best a discussion as we can have in a webinar situation. So um, we are um, going to talk about being strength based. Many young people come to um, your services, to the health departments across the state um, to get sexual health care. And it can be uncomfortable to talk to them about sex. Um, and it can be it can be hard for them to talk to us. And it sometimes can be hard for us to talk to them, too. Um, some of us might be parenting a teen, um, which can affect how we view teen patients. And our values and our life experiences can also influence us. In fact, they do influence us. Um, it's always um, it's not always easy for people of any age to talk about sex. Um, even though I, I think a lot of us feel like um, um, in our jobs, both in the clinic and then I know with me, with adolescent health and family planning, um, it amazes people around the world that I can talk about sex without blushing or whatever. But there is special approaches and we, can, we need to be really careful about how we present ourselves as we talk to all of our clients in the clinic. And, but today um, I'm going to focus on our teen clients. But I think as you look at this, strength based approach, you really can apply it to a client of any age. Um, if you ask people to describe conversations between adults and teens about sex, here are some key words that come up and I'll give you a minute to kind of look through those. You know, in our clinics, we have a chance to create a space where teens will come to us for sexual health services and be honest with us when they do. You know, we can change the dynamic from a negative to an affirming to help our teens make healthier decisions. The conversations we have with our teen patients about sexual health are necessary. Uh, they provide an opportunity for us to give important, accurate information in a respectful way to make it so that they will make a healthy and, and make a healthy long life um, impact 
on, on them and on, on all of our clients. So when we look at that list, you know, there's a lot of words when we talk to teams about it. It's necessary. It gives us an opportunity. It's important. But um, consider this question as we go through this spark. How can we actively commit to shifting away from the negative parts of this list? And what can we do to set a tone that is respectful and healthy for our teens and other clients? Let's consider this quote from Maya Angelou. I'll give you a minute to, to read that. Think about how this applies to, as we talk to our clients, our teen clients about sexual health. You know, we hope that teens don't forget what we say when we tell them about how to prevent pregnancy, STDs, and how to have healthy relationships. But if they don't feel respected, what can be the result? I mean, we can think about that. How, you know, when we are around people and we don't feel respected, you know, it, it, you know, it, we shut down. We don't listen to what they have to say. We don't respect what they have to sh say because they have not um, respected what we've had to say. And that works the same way with teens. Um, so to consider ways we can convey a respectful tone, let's look at two ways a provider has talked to a patient. So read both sides. Our, our provider has provi talked to this patient. There's one way and then another way. I'll give you a moment. Now, before we slam her on the left side, my, you know, let's talk about this, okay? You know, it's easy to understand why her, the provider in the first situation said what they said. Their intent, intent probably comes from a place of concern. Um, you know, however, most people, including teens, already know what risky behaviors they're doing and that they're not healthy. The second approach focuses on what the teen is doing well. Hey, at least you did it 50% of the time or half the time. Let's, you know, let's see what we can do to help me help you find out how we can make this more often than half the time. What can we do for you to, you know, to get you using condoms all the time? Okay. Um, and, and also it's not critical. You respect what they have to say. If, if you slam them, and it, she didn't probably mean to, to put the teen down, but it just in how she said this, you know, it shuts the teen down and, and, and makes them feel disrespected. Um, and, you know, and on, so when you look at the, you know, we say, well, man, but we want them to know that what they did was stupid. Well, they know that they are not making the smartest choices. So kind of helping them own that decision is better than just, you know, kind of um, just saying it to them and moving on. So um, just, you know, that's, that's strength-based compared to not strength-based. Experts recommend that adults adopt a strength-based approach when talking to teens about sex, which frames sexuality as a normal part of life and acknowledges that sexual feelings are natural. It involves listening to the teens and considering their viewpoints with respect, even if their values appear to be and are different from yours. Um, providing accurate information about sexual health gives teens the tools to make healthy decisions. And finally, we can reinforce their healthy decisions with affirming statements. Some adults worry that being respectful when teens are engaging in risky health behaviors is condoning it. And that's not true at all. Um, however, we are more likely to have a positive impact on their behaviors and be truly patient-centered <clears throat> when we treat teens respectfully just like people of all ages want to be treated. Um, we don't all, you know, instead of just being parent on, and you're going to hear me say a lot through all my life that, you know, we help teens learn how to think instead of telling them what to think. Uh, and, and you've got to be strength based as you said that, you know, you know, why, you know, you know, how are you making those decisions? What do you need to help you make a better decision? Um, those are the kind of questions that are more strength based and saying, don't you know, that's not the smartest thing to do and you shouldn't be doing this or that. And you can even add things like abstinence into a conversation um, and, 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 and ask, a, you know, someone and say, you know, you know, absence is the healthiest choice. Sexual risk avoidance, the new key phrase is the healthiest choice. But when teens say, I don't choose that, 
then you don't need to say, well, you know, you're doomed, you know, help them make that better decision about things. Being strength-based means that we are, are counteracting some of the many negative, confusing, or contradictory messages that young people receive about sexuality. In the past, most approaches to adolescent sexual health were based on avoiding disease and focused on what not to do, rather than how to make those healthy decisions. Teens tell us, and research report supports this, that scare tactics, lecturing, and shaming do not help young people avoid healthy, uh, avoid risky behaviors. In fact, it's the opposite. You can still try to help teens reduce um, risky behaviors and reinforce healthy behavior choices they're making with positive affirming comments. Let's look at some more um, um, case studies, some more um, examples of this, of messaging. And so um, this is a time where you need to get to your keyboard <laughs> because we'll look at these and then I want you in the question box to provide me some answers to the questions that will follow from that. So um, they're co uh, collecting a urine sample for universal chlamydia screening. They, um, uh, the medical assistants um, leans over and, and, and whispers in the patient's ears, it's for chlamydia screening. Don't worry. As long as you're not promiscuous, you should be fine. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, how is that not strength based? Uh, you know, <laughs> wh what do you think the intent of the speaker was? Why was the, what are some of the, the intents of the speaker? It's time for you to talk, type in your answers. The team may not know what promiscuous is. Yeah, the team may not know what promiscuous is. They probably they may, but you know. But you just kind of end of connotation with the word promiscuous, right? You know, what are you doing? Calling me a slut? You know, I mean, you know, who knows why she? You know, and isn't it a routine screening for anybody? What? Um, anybody else have a, a a comment about that? How, is she going to have disrespected you because you've already judged her? Um, you know, because what happens when that chlamydia is positive? You know, oh my gosh, what if this chlamydia is, is positive? She's going to think that I'm sleep with everybody in the whole school, you know? So, um, and will she tell her mom? Will she tell her friend who's my mom? You know, there's just, there, there's just that. So as we look at that, um, go back to the slide. What, so, so, um, so, and, and so we've looked at the impact. I mean, what is the impact with that patient? Maybe that patient's like, well, I can't pee right now. Or, um, and, 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 and we might miss the whole boat or she says, no, I don't want to do this. And we maybe miss a chlamydia case. And then she's also shamed. And so will she come back? Um, there's a lot of possible impacts for this. How can we rephrase that message? Um, and be more positive and more strength based. Um, what could we have said? What could this um, medical assistant said that would have been more positive? Time to type. Y'all don't be shy. This is the only bad thing about this method. I think they fell asleep with me. I apologize. <laughs> We could stay here all day. Somebody needs to type something. <laughs> <laughs> that one very strength based. <laughs> that was an idea of not being strength based. <laughs> well, what are some things we could say? We're going to get a urine sample. You know, we we are. Um, this is just to test you for chlamydia and and gonorrhea. Well, I don't have that. You know, no. This is a standard of. Of care for our for all teens anyone under 24 who comes in no shame to that and just an actual fact okay um you know we don't have to add a value statement with that statement we just give them the facts and move on let's look at another one kind of like this one so um scheduling an appointment um the the uh, receptionist says sure joe i can schedule for an sti test wait Weren't you just here a week ago for just one for one just a few weeks ago? I mean, you know, what's wrong with what's 
you know, so what's wrong with that question? I mean, and with that comment? What was his intent of asking that question? I mean, really, what was the intent of Joe and in, in, uh, asking the receptionist and asking Joe that question? Was it even necessary? Yeah. It was not necessary. It's shaming. Um, it is shaming. It, it's very shaming. And is Joe going to show up for that appointment? Okay. And he's running around with an STD that he didn't get rid of. Okay. And um, so. I find that he can only come for STD testing for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> a certain period of time. Yeah. Yeah, it's shaming. It, it, it gives him the wrong message. Okay. It sounds like, what have you been doing that you need tested again already? <laughs> right. So, um, and, and, and again, what's the possible impact? I'm hoping you're, at least since you're not typing, that you're thinking about this where you're sitting. Um, what is the possible impact? Joe doesn't show up for his STD test. Joe hangs up the phone now. Yeah, and, 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 and you miss a major opportunity, one, to test him and get him cured, but also to give him great information about how to not do this again and equip him with condoms and, and, and provide him with um, some real support as he makes decisions. You know, instead of shaming someone for making a risky, bad decision, you know, and talking to them and saying, how can we help you not be back here in another two weeks? You know, you know, it's okay that you're back here, you know, again in two weeks for this situation, but help me help you. How can we do this? What do you need from us? Um, what, what's, what's hanging you up for this? You know, and, and, and having conversation. Um, and so street based also includes um, delving deeper into a client's um, thinking processes because we can't help them change their behaviors unless we know what's what's out there that what's causing them to make the decisions that they're making. And so, you know, we, they just can't be that robot patient that comes in here um, because we're impacting their lives. And then I know some people say, well, that's their parents decision, but all of us who work in the clinic know that a lot of teens don't have that parental support. And so helping them make a decision that, um, and helping them think through a process so that they'll make a better decision when they leave your clinic and empowering them and giving them the tools they need to make a better decision down the road happens when you're strength based. It's not going to happen when you shame them and, and shut them down. And we don't intend to, um, you know, the, the parent role, role kicks in and, you know, we just want to kind of spank them and send them on their way and say, don't do this anymore. But that's not going to be effective. And so we have to figure out a way to do that. Let's look at one last situation. Okay, in the exam room, uh, the provider says, CJ, you're only 17. I can see how hard it is for you to take care of the baby you already have. We just put your IUD in a few months ago, and it sounds like you didn't mind all the side effects. Why would you want to have it removed? Oh, I mean, okay, so... <laughs> What is the intent of the speaker? I, I feel like the speaker, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, but she's got, you know, this whole, like, she's kind of motherly, okay? You know, it, 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 she's trying to be motherly and, and to try and be more positive about the provider, okay? Um, but what is the impact for CJ? You know, I, it, has, it, has it devalued her? Um, she was, you know, was she condescending about the fact that she has a baby at 17 she's got to raise? Um, you know, it's, and it really borders a little bit on coercion and um, saying, well, I'm not, you know, I don't think I need to take this IUD out. If a patient wants their IUD out, um, you know, it really borders a little bit on coercion. She was not gathering more information to understand the patient's rationale. She didn't even say, tell me more about this. Tell me, thank you, Dorothy, you know, tell me a little more about why you want this IUD out. If, you, if, the, if the side effects seem to be going away and you haven't minded the side effects, um, tell me some more information about this, you know. Um, so there's just so much impact on that patient. They're devalued. They're not, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to think you have respect for them. 
So then they don't have respect for you. And then you walk away saying, well, that child didn't have any respect for me. Well, you know, we need to kind of do a little, you know, self check on ourselves, know ourselves and know how we feel about things. Um, You know, bottom line is young people deserve accurate information and respectful treatment related to sexual health. Um, and really our values need to be dropped off of that personally. Um, and, and so what challenges do we have with practicing this? Um, yes, we feel like we do know what's best for this client, but that's not always necessarily true. And, and you know, how can we be strength based? You know, what can each of us do in our different roles to be strength based? Um, you know, one of the big things we need to do is to know ourselves um, and not be caught in a situation where our values and our, our thoughts and our, our beliefs are challenged. Um, and then I, we've taught uh, for years now to teach you how to do what we call stop, drop, and roll. So when a patient or, or an outlet education world, when they come in and and they, they have a question or they have an action or activity or whatever that, you know, kind of gets to you. You need to stop for a moment, drop your value attitudes off of that. You can't ever drop your values away, but kind of just take a step back and regroup, kind of dropping your thoughts away and then turn it back to the patient, roll it right back to the patient. And that's how you're strength based, you know, instead of just saying, well, let me tell you what I think stop strength based is stopping dropping off your attitude and then focusing on the patient how can we make your life when you made this decision or you know and when they ask you questions helping them think through that decision to help them make a better decision and empower them to own what they need to do to be compliant in their care instead of just saying you must do this um, it's it doesn't take a whole lot of time um, it lets your patients and your clients know that that they that you care about them and that you are you you value where they're at and you want to see them in a better situation. Um, also, watch being a, it's so hard not to be a parent when you're when we're parents, and so um, recognizing that you know kind of pull back on the whole parental world and treat them more like an adult and have as much of an adult conversation with them as possible. And 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 you'll it's it's not easy. Um, honestly, it's not easy, but at, at first, especially the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's not easy when the kids go back to being that child role, but help them say, you know, if you're making these kind of sexual decisions, then you have to take responsibility for this. How can we help you be responsible? And they're like, well, I can't do whatever. Say, so how, what are some other decisions you need to make? Just taking it and rolling it back to the client to help them work through that thinking process. Um, so the, the bottom line is, the, you know, what can each of us do in our different roles to be strength based? You know, it's to we need to uh, look for positives. OK, you know, well, at least you use those condoms half the time. You know, um, it's also, um, again, helping teens think through um, what they did and uh, helping them learn how to think and own their decisions. So. To keep this conversation going, I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna get to Joy today. Last time I didn't get this happen, it didn't happen. But I'm gonna send you out a um, what we call little sparklers, and they're like one pagers. Um, and I'm gonna encourage you to they're like little case studies and suggestions. Um, stick them around your clinic area, um, not where patients can see, but like maybe like in your bathroom or on a bulletin board. Um, there's three or four of them this time, and uh, and that way through the month when you've got a minute to, you know, have a, um, a minute to read through those to, to just get reinforced on how to be strength based. Always, um, you're more than welcome to contact me with anything. And I appreciate you listening to me. Have a great day. Benita, I uh, thank you so much, first of all, for presenting with us today. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, I'd like to, I, I've gotten several questions about the family planning uh, training calendar. And as you know, there's a lot of new uh, nurses in local health departments. And this is CE time for all of us as the October 31st rolls around. So could, and you and I have had some great conversations about the training calendar and what that may look like perhaps in, in the future. Okay. But 
um, on the short term, can you just briefly share with the with uh, the nurse leaders on the on the webinar today what your what your plans are? Yes. First of Thank all, you. I want to apologize for this. Uh, the challenges in um, getting uh, the calendar update are are Mount Everest proportions, and so <laughs> uh, and I apologize for that. And 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 there's a lot of factors that cause that. Um, some things that have happened. Um, one of the biggest challenges we had was the mandatory reporting uh, modules expired, and they, I mean, they were old. They, they needed to expire. But we really had some real challenges in getting it redone. Um, we've met roadblocks where we've had to cooperate with, we've tried cooperating with ECBS and some other things. But the good news is, is that um, the, um, it's going to be taped next week, right, Lisa? We're taping the new mandatory reporting uh, modules next week, and we're breaking them. They're going to be there's going to be there's going to be th is that counting um, human trafficking? There's there's going to be three modules. One's on they're going to be short modules, but so that way you don't have to sit for two hours or whatever. One's on child abuse, one's on adult abuse, and one's on domestic violence, I believe is how they're going to go. And we also have a new human trafficking module that Train's working with right now to get that loaded. And so um, so you'll, that will, by, we're hoping by November they'll all be available, okay? Definitely by the first of the year, depending, depending on, ED, uh, you know, train, the train folks, the EWD, am I saying that right? Yeah, EWD folks, they... Um, they're challenged too with some staffing issues and stuff. So um, I, it's been a real conundrum when you're saying, well, that's not helping us at all, but we are working diligently. So what can you all do? There's still a lot of courses on train related to cultural competency and family planning. If you haven't had your family planning basics course from the National um, Family Planning Training Center, um, take that. It's really good. And you're thinking, well, I work in family planning, but I take it about every year to every other year and always get a refresher that really helps me remember what we do and why we do it. And there's also a lot of other courses on the Family Planning National Training Center website um, that um, is very beneficial. And you, it used to be they charge for CEUs and they don't anymore. And so you can get some CEUs through that. Also, if you didn't see the women's health update back in April, um, it was really good. It, it covers you for family planning and uh, it's on train so you can watch that. Um, there's a lot of different things. And then lastly, we are looking at possibly, you know, don't get too excited, but we are really exploring the possibility of lessening the family planning requirements, okay, um, or at least switching them a little bit. So one, they're not as um, cumbersome for you all, um, but and still get the job done and, and also meet the um, requirements of the grant. So we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet, but, but we're supportive. Joy's very supportive of this, um, so we are really we're we're trying to tweak that situation. So maybe it's not going to be so cumbersome for you. Um, unfortunately, the grant requires that you get mandatory reporting every year. They require that you have a cultural competency course, and they strongly suggest that you take the family planning basics every three years. So we're not really sure what that's going to look like. Um, but um, so that's what's going on with that. Does anybody have any questions? I apologize for the big delay. Well, if you do, either email me or Lisa Mills or Joy, and we will try and work through it. So thank you all for your patience. And then this one, not your, I can't let you go yet. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a lot easier. Um, you're going to have some personnel changes in the adolescent health program I am. on November 1st, and that person just happens to be in the room. So if you want to invite Lisa to come up and introduce her, this would be a perfect opportunity, Benita, to take care of that. Well, I'm sure it's allowed to. So Lisa, um, as many of you know, Lisa Mills, um, who came back to us in April, she can wave to you. Hi. Anyway, Lisa um, has graciously agreed to be our adolescent health person, our nurse consultant inspector in Allison House. So we'll call her Allison Health Coordinator. I'm so excited about that. She's been doing a lot of um, stuff in that because we work together as a team. Um, so actually, they, she's going to switch over to Adolescent Health and take a lot of, off my plate. And I'm excited about that. And she's going to do a great job. <laughs> and um, But um, 
and I'm still the Adolescent Health Family Planning Program Coordinator, but we will have a nurse consultant inspector job open in family planning. So if any of you all are interested in coming to Frankfurt, um, don't tell your directors I said that, but uh, you know, watch for it on the, on the uh, it'll be posted hopefully sometime in the near future. So, um, but we are just, she's new to the adolescent health world, but she's not new to our work. And so um, we're excited that she's taking on that responsibility. Thanks. That's all, Benita. Are you sure? Can I leave now? <laughs> Thank you. Next, it's very exciting for me to introduce one of the newest members of the Division of Women's Health. Emily Goodwin uh, comes to us as a newly uh, new graduate of Eastern Kentucky University through their MPH program. We actually had Emily here in Frankfurt this summer with us in the division uh, for her MPH uh, internship. And she did such a wonderful job that we didn't want to let her go. Um, and so she's been with us uh, throughout, uh, I guess since May actually, but just officially here within the last couple of months after she, after she graduated. But Emily is our new recruitment coordinator for the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program. And so she's been so busy and so active and, and working with folks here at the cabinet and supporting uh, many of your all's efforts at the local health departments for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I wanted to invite her to come and, and to provide some updates about uh, activities for October and, and support perhaps what you all are doing and what you all have planned and then share a couple of new initiatives that she's working on to kind of give you the heads up of as far as what to expect from from her role and her position uh, from the recruitment perspective in the next several months. So Emily, thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. We're glad you're here with us today. Let's watch those cords there. Yeah. Thank you, Joy. Okay. Now you want me to pull you up? Or you All right. So, one of the best things about hiring a, a young person is I have another person who can help me with technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, just to introduce myself again, my name is Emily Goodwin. I am the recruitment coordinator for the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program. Um, I'm very excited to be here and working with the team and just. Um, helping them with anything that they need and of course some things that I have on my own. Uh, so I'll start with what my role is as recruitment coordinator. Um, it is just to work with community partners to connect um, women in those communities with breast and cervical cancer screening services. So um, community partners like that include um, staff at the local health departments, patient navigators or community health workers and the FQHCs. Um, and other community-based uh, clinics, as well as staff from organizations such as American Cancer Society, uh, Kentucky Cancer Program, Regional Cancer Control Specialists, and other cyst uh, cancer control program staff. Uh, we'll be working together to coordinate services in order to increase access to breast and cervical cancer screenings in underserved areas of the state. Uh, so, we will recruit KWCSP eligible women for screenings and educate all women um, about the importance of breast and cervical cancer screenings and link those women to health systems to get uh, the needed clinical care. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know if you can, can I see this, the, the tree? All right, so um, Breast Cancer Action Month, um, part of the activities that I've got going on um, as part of my job are to work throughout October to encourage Kentuckians to take action against breast, and breast cancer. So um, here you see the tree that we have on display um, here at CHFS. It's our memory tree and I've added memory survivor tree uh, just because it's been an overwhelming response of how many uh, people here in the building and throughout the state have sent me emails of names of survivors or in memory of someone that's lost their life to breast cancer. So I actually have to go put more ribbons out there, which I'm happy to do. But um, it was just, it's been a great response for this tree. 
And um, that's something they could easily replicate in your local Definitely. Uh-huh. Definitely. And um, this is about six foot tall. So yours doesn't have to be six foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just anything like that. Some um, other organizations actually sent me pictures of their tree and all so beautiful in their own way. Um, so we have this tree um, here in the lobby at CHFS. Um, we had a pink out photo contest, which many have sent me some photos. You'll see that on the next slide, some fun ones I've got. Um, breast cancer awareness trivia questions, which are going out this week, which again, overwhelming response from that. I think on Monday I had 700 emails of people um, answering uh, questions and sending me in their answers. And of course there's a prize involved, so that has really <laughs> bumped it up for that. Um, but I'd probably go back to find 500 emails today, which is again, great. The best problem to have. And I love it. Um, love, uh, working with all of that. Uh, next week we have a week here at CHFS and we're trying to coordinate, um, with probably a tailgate type event just to, to increase the, the pink, uh, here at CHFS. And, um, we've worked with local just here in Frankfurt, um, Many of you may local uh, high school football games. They may do something for breast cancer awareness month here in Frankfurt, the local high schools. They, the players always wear pink, pink socks, pink uh, sweatbands, things like that. So we've uh, gone out and, and uh, paid tribute to survivors out there in the community, the football games. And again, a great response uh, from that as well. Uh, one of the projects that I have been working on, uh, worked on over the summer here, um, is survivorship, and I'm continuing to work on that. Uh, so I'm in the process of a draft, a rough draft, of course, always adding to it. Um, there's always more resources to incorporate and um, ideas to explore, but I've been working on that through uh, KWCSB. Um, so uh, when women are diagnosed in KWCSB, and they go on to the treatment program, it was kind of um, a gap in care when those women leave the treatment program. So um, the idea of this is to provide women with um, sort of a guide um, and a tool to help them uh, navigate themselves um, in a way um, and be their own kind of organized, um, just for them to have a way to organize all of their uh, cancer information from the start of their cancer journey throughout. So um, uh, again, like a just a compiled um, list of resources, information, and a way to organize their cancer journey, including um, their type of cancer and specific information about that, medications, procedures that they've gone through, and contact information for all of the doctors on their cancer care team and other professionals that have helped them and more. Uh, so far, I've had the Breast Cancer Advisory Committee and the Breast Cancer Trust Fund Board review those, and I've been working closely with American Cancer Society um, to make that the best that it could be. So again, still in the works on that, but hopefully that's something that you will be seeing in the future. And then uh, my last point on this slide is worksite wellness. Now, this is not my baby. This is uh, someone else's, but um, as KWCSP, we are um, initiating a worksite wellness project by launching a newsletter into the Frankfurt Area, Area Chamber of Commerce e-newsletter. And this will be an, uh, an invitation to employers to participate in worksite wellness project with KWCSP and American Cancer Society. So um, together, it's hoped that a wellness program will be developed to improve breast and cervical cancer screening among their employees. And then, of course, the ultimate goal would be to um, help the employer implement those wellness policies and programs to increase the cancer screening rates and encourage healthier behaviors at work. So this is a little bit more of a fun slide, I think. So there's a lot of pink. Um, That's the slide that clogged up my email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even think about that. I was just like, how, how many pictures can I fit on that one slide? Um, so um, I'll just uh, say a little bit about the pictures. So up um, in the top left corner, we had uh, a Women's Health Day in Lee County. And so uh, Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program worked with Juniper Health. And, 
and the American Cancer Society King's Daughter Medical Center. They have the MAM van um, and Lee County Health Department as well as a few others to bring that MAM van down to Lee County. And um, so that day, 29 women received mammograms that might not otherwise receive mammograms. So uh, that's a big deal. And we were really excited to work together and collaborate and make that happen. Uh, moving down, uh, this is a, for the the rest of these photos are for the pink out contest. Um, so the commissioner's office has their pink out there in the bottom left. Uh, we've got the top middle is Warren County DCBS with the ribbon. The bottom middle is Estill County Family Support Staff. And then I don't know if you can tell, but it's like a spoof on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> um, and then the woman in feet is Violet Booberries. So um, <laughs> I just thought I had to point that out because it's funny. Um, the top right, uh, we have Hardin County FSOSs. Uh, they provided snacks for a cure. So like their whole spread there is all around pink and breast cancer. Um, and then middle right, we have Gary County DCBS office. And then down there at the bottom, we have Grayson County Protection and Permanency. And um, for those of you who are watching that participated, uh, I just want to say thank you. And for those of you that haven't, I would like to invite you to participate. Uh, we would love to see the pink for Breast Cancer Action Month um, and just any activities that you all have going on. We'd love to know about them please feel free to share. Um, it's, again, overwhelming response, but it's it's great to, to have so many pictures. I don't know which pictures to choose for the, the pink contest. So, um, <laughs> so um, please feel free to send me anything that you want. And my contact information is on the last slide. We'll get to that. Um, so here we are, the Division of Women's Health in front of our tree with all of our pink. And Rom holding the flowers. Rom holding your flowers. <laughs> Those flowers live in Joy's office. And <laughs> Rom said, I'll take the flowers. <laughs> We've got all of our umbrellas and other pink things. And then here is my contact information. I didn't know if anyone would have questions for me. Yeah, How do I? Yeah, does anyone have any questions for me? Did I do this correctly? <laughs> You can see now why we didn't want to let Emily go at the end of the summer. <laughs> Do you want to mention just briefly about the Facebook? You've really beat that up, and I, I can see all the different yeah, posts that you have. put. Yeah, so why don't yes. you just sure. you, you use that as maybe a venue to provide outreach? Sure. So um, I have been um, just looking on our Facebook. Um, when I started my internship, I um, noticed that we had a Facebook, but I was like, who has access to this? So when I finally gained access to it, um, I kind of took that on and uh, went, I just dove right in. Um, I have been posting a lot of things for Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program, and um, can, it, our Facebook name is KWCSP DPH. I'm working on changing that to just women's health. Um, but if I ask to be your friend or like something, it's me. So um, it's not just some stranger. It's, it's, it's not me, it's, it's you. It's me. Um, but I've just been sharing a lot of things relevant to women's health and especially breast and cervical cancer screenings and things like that. So again, if you send in pictures, it's a great avenue to post them on our Facebook. And of course, I've had permission um, to do all of that, but um, it's just a great way to um, add that extra layers like, hey, we're here and um, we support breast cancer and things like that. Um, through Facebook, actually, yesterday I learned that yesterday was Bra Day, <laughs> Breast Cancer Reconstruction oh. Awareness. Uh oh. Yes. That's so, sad. I didn't know that um, day. Uh, through CODA, through tissue donation. Oh. oh. Yeah. So, um, you learn something new every day, even on Facebook. Um, I don't know if we have any I questions. Don't know what but I definitely have um, been beefing up the Facebook. I should say, <laughs> really stacking the, yeah. the cards in our favor. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't thank know. you. Yeah. I'll, I'll close it. Thank, thank you, Joy. Thank you, and thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Thank 
Whoops. Alright, next <clears throat> we have Amanda Hunt, who is a registered nurse with the Reportable Disease Branch um, up in, upstairs in our Division of Epidemiology and Health Planning, and she is the nurse who many, if not most, or all of you all have been working with on the Hepatitis A outbreak. Um, she's a, a great wealth and source of information. Uh, through going through this, uh, through this, the st different stages of the outbreak, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be seeing the end of that maybe next year. <laughs> so anyway, so I am well, uh, glad to welcome Amanda here today to provide us a, a hepatitis A outbreak update. Thank you, Amanda, for being here today. Good morning, everybody. So before we get started, I just want to thank you all for all the hard work you're doing. I know everybody is crazy busy with this and a bunch of other reportable diseases. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, we're just trying to keep everybody um, up to date and aware of everything that's going on. So just a few uh, statistics. Right now, as of October 6th, we have a total of 2,050 cases. With 1,991 of those being just 2018. We have 91 of our 120 counties affected, that's 76%. We have 1,126 hospitalizations for a 55% rate. We are at 14 deaths, which is less than 1%. Median age is 36 years with a range of 1 to 84. Um, HAV genotype testing, we have currently 530 that are genotype 1B, and most of those are California Cluster A, and there are still some, some number of those pending. This is just a look at our curve, um, and of course October is not complete yet, but you can see that we had a pretty big surge in the spring and summer of this year. And that's just for Kentucky? Yes, yes. And this is a map of Kentucky with all the counties affected. And you can see we have a little cluster um, up around Jefferson County, Bullock County, and then in the eastern part of the state. And so 91 out of 120? Right. <clears throat> yep. Counties, wow. This is our risk factors. They've pretty much remained steady with uh, illicit drug use being the number one but we are seeing uh, a little bit of an increase in cases that have no known risk factors or at least none that they admit to um, because you know a lot of them who knows if they're going to tell you if they're using illicit drugs or not but so that's pretty much staying the same and just a few odds and ends that we wanted to let you know about 317 funds are available again beginning in october so you can contact immunization staff uh, if you have questions about that. And just remember that all vaccines, private stock or 317 have to be entered into the registry. Um, we had some questions about that. And we'd like to ask you to reach out to your emergency departments and really encourage vaccination there. A lot of these cases are being seen there for um, different various reasons, overdoses, uh, hepatitis B or C. Um, so if they suspect those types of things going on with these with these patients, they really should be uh, offering vaccination there. Uh, a lot of times once they leave there, they leave AMA, a lot of times we can't find them after that. That's a problem that everybody's having. Um, you have some guidance documents on Google Drive. There's a lot of good information there. Katie sent that email out about 
months. It's been about a month. I don't know. I can't remember times now anymore. But um, if you don't have that, you can let us know. We can get that to you. Uh, it's got a lot of good information on there. Um, also, don't forget to create a notification on your investigations. I'm still seeing every once in a while a few in open investigations that have no notification. So I don't see it unless I just happen upon it accidentally. Um, if you haven't had time to interview the case, but you've got everything else that makes them meet case definition, just go ahead and create that notification and I'll go ahead and approve it. And then you can always go back in and edit and add stuff to it and let us know. Um, also, please list signs and symptoms under general comments in order to classify the case. I can't, even though you, you say yes, they're symptomatic, I still have to have the signs and symptoms listed uh, in order to, to, to classify that case. And I have also um, one final reminder. I've also seen um, a lot where in the drop down menus for IGM, it says yes, but then there's nothing uploaded in the actual lab report section. And I do need that there um, so that I have record of that. Um, do you have anything, Jennifer? I have a question. I don't know if this is an odds or an ends. But could, could you talk just and just reiterate perhaps uh, as far as entering information into the into NEDS for FA? Okay, so I created a, uh, there is a webinar that you can go and watch if you have time. And I know you're all super busy, but I don't think it was very long. I tried to make it kind of short, but it's pretty thorough in, as far as what steps you take when you're entering an investigation and what has to be done. Um, don't be afraid of NEDS. I get a lot of calls where people are just, they're not used to NEDS and they're afraid they're going to mess it up. I, I don't know. You, you pretty much can't mess it up. Um, you can, and you can always go back in and edit. You can call me and, and I can change something. I don't mind a bit in the world. So when you're entering those cases in, just, um, you can look, take a look at that webinar. Uh, I also, we sent out, and this has been quite some time ago. So if you don't have it, you can let me know and I'll send it to you. Uh, a list of kind of things to prioritize on the investigation and NEDS entry, things that I, I really, really have to have and things that it's not that big of a deal if I don't have it. Um, so if you don't have that, you can let me know. Um, try to make sure that you're not creating two different investigations for the same person. I've seen a lot of repeat investigations um, with all the same information, but it's, it's in there. It's actually two investigations have been created, two notifications have been created, two different NEDS IDs. So it kind of, uh, I try to catch those, but sometimes I don't until it's, I've already sent them through. So, um, that's, can you talk about the checklists that are under development? And oh yeah, them? we have, so we have those. some, uh, we have some guidance that we're trying to develop, trying to do it quickly. Um, with some information on what each um, investigation of HIV would require as far as nursing, environmental, epidemiology. And it's just like, a, it's gonna be in a kind of a checklist form uh, to kind of give some guidance, um, especially those counties that are just now seeing cases or haven't seen cases so that they are prepared and they can just go to that and go down the list. Um, so hopefully that will be done pretty soon. Um, I know they're working on, and this might be more of a Katie question if you have questions about it, but uh, they are working on tier four funding for vaccinations. Um, that's not completely done yet, but hopefully soon. Um, that's kind of all I can think of. I'm sure there's other stuff, but um, if you have questions, you can email me or Katie or Jennifer. Um, so that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? And you can always call me, email me. I don't mind. I don't Would you mind to give them their, your um, phone number just in case? Oh, you know what? I don't think Do I have that on there. Text line? It's, uh, I don't have it on there. I forgot okay. about that. Uh, I think everybody knows my phone number. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's 502-564-3261, and my extension is 4242, and it's amanda.hunt at ky.gov, but I think, I think probably most of you, I think I've talked, I think I've talked to every single county. Is that right? I'm fairly certain. <laughs> I feel like I have, and maybe some that 
or in other states. I don't know. <laughs> so so the, the checklist, just to go back to those just a moment, they'll be sorted uh, and organized two different ways. Um, one will be pre-event for hepatitis A, and then it, the next step would be you have your first case, um, you know, you have your first diagnosed case, and then you have a, a, a designated outbreak, and then kind of an evaluation after action report type of uh, phase. And then, as Amanda mentioned, there will also be uh, the, organ the checklist will be organized by function, um, and she mentioned clinical, laboratory, mm -hmm. epi, administration, public information will be another category. And so we, we talk back and forth um, ad nauseum as far as how to organize the checklist. And so the decision was finally made to offer them both ways. Um, so a local health department could choose which way they found uh, the most helpful and beneficial to them to organize their information and to proceed uh, and be prepared on the front end in the, in the hepatitis A uh, potential outbreak event. So there's lots of resources out, as, as uh, Amanda mentioned, on Google Google Docs. Google Drive. I, I won't, I'd be afraid to say <laughs> org or com yeah, or whatever. Uh, it's hey, Google Katie, Google. send it out. If you don't have it, you can yeah. let us know. We'll get to you. And so that information was sent out perhaps before your agency actually had a, a case of hepatitis A. So as you, as you know, there's uh, of the 91 local health departments, that have had a, a, a case, they're in 91 different stages or phases of the of the outbreak. So um, if you haven't noticed or realized that those resources are available to you, there's tons out there now. And so mm -hmm. please, as Amanda graciously has said, uh, you know, feel free to, to uh, link up with her and she can, can uh, provide those, those guidance documents. They've all been created and, and based on best, of course, CDC, best practices, information that we've actually learned here um, in Kentucky through the um, through this process and from other states, California, Michigan, West Virginia, so forth and so on. Some of the states who have had um, already have had large outbreak numbers as well. Any questions for Amanda before I let her go? Or questions about NADS? For cafe? Okay. All righty then. Thank All you so right. much, Thank Amanda, you. for coming. And everybody today. keep up the good work. I know it's yeah. tiresome. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer, too, for coming. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to pull up Jamie's presentation next. Okay. So next I'd like to introduce another new uh, DPH uh, team member, uh, Jamie McLemore who is a show, social worker, excuse me, by training. Uh, she's now a program coordinator with the HIV program here at DPH um, in, within the Division of Epidemiology and Health Planning. <clears throat> excuse me. Jamie comes to us by way of the North Central District Health Department. So she has a lot of great um, health department knowledge and she's uh, certainly a, a local health department advocate and she's uh, carried that love for local health department uh, practice and services with her here to Frankfurt. So Jamie's new role, um, I'll, I won't steal all of her thunder, uh, Jamie's new role is to work with the transgender population um, that, that you all serve, other providers may serve, particularly in respect to uh, working with the population to uh, get their HIV testing. So as you know, it's a very vulnerable uh, special population. 
um, and they are, would be uh, potentially at risk for HIV. And so that's Jamie's role is to uh, work uh, in, in conjunction with different providers uh, throughout the state and with the transgender population to provide um, the service access to care uh, support that the population might need. So we had a, a several presentations, had two presentations actually at the APRN conference uh, this week that, that covered uh, serving the transgender population and being inclusive in our care uh, when, when we have a transgender uh, client. And so, and Jamie was there also to speak with the APRNs. So we've asked her also to uh, come today and share that uh, similar information with you all. So you can have that information in your resource in your resources. So thank you, Jamie, for being here with us today. And if I left anything out in your introduction, please feel free to add to, okay? So all you need to do is just forward your slides to two that arrow, okay? And here's the camera right there. Thank you so see much. You're welcome. They'll see your slides. They won't see you yet until you, unless you turn off your power. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. As Joy said, I'm Jamie Michaelmore. I am new with KDPH. I'm a program coordinator for the HIV AIDS prevention branch. Today makes two months and 11 days that I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I love it. it it's, it's a great opportunity. I really work, love the people I work with. So today what I'm going to talk to you all about is one test, two lives. And I'm sure that everybody is familiar with this. This is testing uh, pregnant women. And as we know, even if a mom has HIV, her baby does not have to follow in her footsteps. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The mission of the one step, one test, two lives, I'm sorry. Uh, campaign is from the CDC to help promote transmission of HIV from baby from mother to baby. The campaign focuses on all women get tested for HIV early in the pregnancy. Even if a, if a mother has HIV, the baby doesn't have to have it, which that is such a great thing. Women living with HIV who get and stay in treatment reduces their baby's risk of infection to 1% or less. Okay, according to our surveillance report done in June of 2017, between 1982 and 2011, we had 28 reported cases. In 2012, we had five cases. In 2013, there was three cases. 2014, seven cases, 2016, two cases, and last year, 2017, we had no reported cases. So you all are doing an absolute fantastic job. So kudos to all of you all in the health department settings that is pushing and promoting this. So testing for HIV in pregnant women. All women who are pregnant or planning to get pregnant should get tested for HIV as early as possible. A diagnosis of HIV in a timely manner is essential to allow time for the intervention to reduce the risk of prenatal infections. It's never too late to test. If your patient refuses to take the HIV test, please revisit that with them. If there's barriers, if you're experiencing anything that we can help you with, we're here to support you to help you promote one test, two lives for women who are pregnant. And please contact me if you have any questions about it. Okay, so we know our local health departments is doing a great job. They're screening pregnant women. We have zero cases reported for 2017, and we want to continue to promote one test, two lives. Okay, so to promote one test, two lives, your department, your health department can receive some mop top pens and for you all that knows me, knows I like to give stuff away. This is the pens. They will have KD, PH, one test, two lives on them, the red. And this will be information that, that, will sell, that will be on these six pens that you can give to people and people will remember this by. So I think this is a great promoting tool for our clinics. Okay. So every health department that sets up a display promoting one test, two lives at your clinic 
take a picture, emails it to me, you will receive some mop top pens. So you can go to the website and there is all kinds of free materials there. There are brochures there, there are laminated uh, information there. It is all free. You can download, print, order, anything that you want to to fix the clinic up the way that you want to. Uh, we want to really promote this in every health department. And I'm willing to do whatever I can to help you all promote it. So um, if you have any questions about it, if you want to design it the way that you want to run your own clinic and your own clients, you work with them every day. You know what works best in your clinic. You know your town and you know your community. So I really encourage every, every clinic to do this. I challenge every clinic to do this. And I am more than willing to do anything that I can to help you all. You can contact me. Uh, my email is up here. Uh, I'll be more than willing to help you out. We will, we want to start on this as soon as we can and have it done or have all the pictures in by December the 31st, 2018. And what I'd like to do is a collage with the pictures and I'm really excited about it. So uh, I'd love to see your all's pictures and what ideas that you come up with and to help promote this. So with that being said, um, that that's all the information I've got. If you all have got any questions. Are there any questions for Jamie? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you and so much. Welcome to DPH. We're glad to have you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I've invited Gail Yoakum with the HIV program. She's a, a supervisor to talk about, let me see, I'm going to hit a button and if I do something wrong, we'll figure it out here. <clears throat> no. Now. I'll just I'll just put this over to the side. Gail, do you want to talk um, a little bit about the new HIV documentation form that will the camera will be right here for you? Uh, the new documentation form that will go into effect November first. I know that you and Bob provided uh, trainings and and uh, discussions at the last public health nursing mm -hmm. webinar, but. Now that I think this is getting ready to be a reality, it's a we sent out the email last week, um, and you've sent me some more information right. that I need to send out when I get back to my desk this afternoon. So there's more information forthcoming, but I, we didn't want to miss this opportunity for okay. you to, to talk with the local health department nurse leaders and to afford them the opportunity to ask any questions they may have about the form. So we've got plenty of time, so so take your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, as you all know, we uh, have a new HIV test form that is going to be in effect November the 1st. And the form changed because we're under a new CDC grant uh, which is PS 18-1802, and they are requiring, the CDC is requiring uh, more data elements that weren't on the previous form, so it had to be revised to reflect all of those. And um, on the new form, there are questions about STD testing and uh, the results of those tests. There's some uh, transgender questions. And um, it's pretty much the same format as what you're accustomed to with the form. It looks a lot longer, but there are check boxes, so I think you can progress through it fairly quickly. Uh, of course, if there's a positive response to any of the questions, uh, that will warrant engaging your uh, patient in some conversation about that. I've had several questions emailed to me and uh, what I will say is there's a training October the 24th at 10 a.m. And that will go through the test form step by step. And all of you are welcome to attend that. And I've been sending out that email link um, as people have contacted me. 
and I will make sure to provide that to Joy so you all can register for that and be on that training. Um, some of the questions that have arisen are, do we still use the Kentucky stickers? Yes, you will use that. And uh, for the uh, grant number, it's the PS181802. And if, if you leave that off, that's perfectly fine. We can fill that in uh, when you send the forms in to us. The majority of the health departments do send their forms to Frankfurt to be entered into Evaluation Web, which is the federal database. Uh, we have just a few large health departments that have their own data entry folks. Um, so hopefully they'll be on the webinar to um, get the instruction for uh, data entry screens. Uh, those of you who don't uh, enter your own forms won't need to uh, remain on the call for the data entry screens or the reflex reports. Of course, you're welcome to stay, um, but I know your time is very limited. So uh, we will do the piece on the actual completion of the form first and then go to those next two pieces. And again, it's not a lot um, different format than what you're accustomed to. It's asking about previous tests and what were the results of those and do the folks know the dates. There's demographics to be captured on the individual uh, so we'll know who we're testing and where. Um, I will say that as of November 1, you must put any tests from that day forward on the new form. Um, if you don't, we can't enter it and it cannot be counted. If you have old test forms um, that you've just been waiting around to send in, please go ahead and send those to us because they're going to have a cutoff date for uh, being able to submit on the old form. And eventually that document will be removed from Evaluation Web. And we certainly want everybody to get credit for uh, the tests that you've completed. So again, please send those in as soon as possible. Um, I think the webinar will be the most helpful thing to you, and it shouldn't be um, really long. They'll go through each of the fields on the test form, and you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, so that information will be forthcoming to you with the link to register, and again, that's October the 24th at 10 a.m. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Gail, for uh, providing that update and then also pro also providing additional training on the 24th so everybody will uh, be able to have the chance to bring their HIV staff together and be able to review that targeted uh, for that targeted training. We appreciate all that you do. And, uh, and same we'll, here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Next. Uh, I thought it would be fun for you all, enjoyable for you all to uh, learn a little bit more about the Hurricane Florence strike team, nurse strike team that um, DPH and local health departments uh, mostly uh, were represented on our 11 person team that responded recently to Hurricane Florence. And so one of our nurse leaders here in the Department for Public Health, Nancy Hamilton, uh, was one of the nurses on the nurse strike team and she is here today to share a, a brief update about their um, initiative, their response, their responses uh, res and uh, have some pictures and you know, share some pictures with us and talk to us a little bit from a first-hand perspective about the relief efforts and Nancy we so appreciate you and the other members of the nurse strike team uh, representing Kentucky so well. So with that, I'll pull up Nancy's PowerPoint. There you go. And then you just, the camera's right here, Nancy, and then you just forward your slides right there. Nancy, right. Mm -hmm. They're sitting left hand. Yeah, there you go. They'll, they'll see the video. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I should say. 
Um, I'm filling in for Angela Kick. She could not be here um, this morning because she had other obligations um, uh, for training obligations. And uh, I just wanted to give you a little update using her slides and then giving my story. Uh, my name is Nancy Hamilton. I'm a nurse inspector with reportable D disease section. And on Sunday, September 19, 2018, I, along with 10 other people, formed the Kentucky Nurses Strike team and we began our journey to North Carolina to get our final orders once we arrived there. So just to give you a little bit of update on um, Hurricane Florence. She made landfall at 7.15 a.m. on a Friday morning on September 14th near Wrightsville. She was not supposed to be there. She was supposed to be uh, making landfall at Ocean Isle, but she missed it. And you'll learn why that's a good thing a little bit later on. But um, where she landed near Wrightsville Beach in North Carolina is about 11 miles from Wilmington, about 130 miles southeast from Raleigh. And that being from Raleigh is important too, and you'll notice that later on. So that's just a little geography lesson there. Okay, um, Hurricane Florence, um, I'm sorry. When Hurricane Florence made landfall, she was a category one. She should have been a category five, but she lost a little bit of her strength. So along with that, with her strength being lost, she also lost a little bit of speed. So she was only going about five miles an hour. So what that meant was all that water just stayed there. She didn't hurry through the area, she wanted to stay and drench the area. So she was given about 35 inches of rain to North Carolina, which is almost about three feet of water. But as Angela says, it's almost 8 trillion gallons of water. Now, I don't even, I can't even comprehend that. I don't even know what would hold that. Carolina didn't hold it, that was for sure. <laughs> you know, I don't know what would hold that, but that is a huge amount of water. And the flooding is what kept most of the people out of their house and in the shelter. I'm not going to downgrade the horrible uh, strength of the hurricane, but um, the flooding was what did the most damage. More than 40 people lost their lives and more than 2 million people left their homes. Not all of them were in our shelter. Um, several of them were though. So Wilmington, Southport, Fayetteville, Greensboro are just a few of the towns located on the Cape Fear River. Um, we had several families that had homes that were flooded by this river. The water in the Cape Fear River was enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool every two seconds and entire communities were isolated because of this river washing away uh, parts of the road, as you can see on the, on the video. The water divided Brunswick County into three islands. Brunswick County had about 1,050 square miles and Pike County, which is Kentucky's largest county, has about 789, so there's about a third more of Brunswick County. Uh, so, it was divided into three islands. Therefore, those three islands cut the communities off from everything. Uh, and one of the reasons the water was able to do this was there was a, a Sanford Dam, which housed three uh, lakes, Big Lake, North Lake, and Pine Lake. And when that dam gave away because of all that water, it flooded the entire uh, neighborhood and it that's where most of that water came from that uh, divided, the, divided the county into islands. Uh, the number one reason that, as I said before, that families fled was flooding and no electricity. Um, but uh, this community where this road is broken off was called Boiling Springs. I think it was in the news quite a bit. Um, but the entire community came to our shelter. So, you know, one of our thoughts was, why don't we just put them all in one big room so they could be like their community, you know, but we, we didn't do that. We had to separate them differently, but, you know, they all were talking and so they all knew each other. It was one big family. 
And this went, this uh, slide just shows how quickly the uh, strike team was formed. Um, the decision to form a strike team began on September 10th and by Sunday, September 16th, we were on our way to North Carolina. Um, we, we were instructed on environmental concerns and packing requirements and informed of travel as much as they could tell us. Um, but at that time, we did not know where we would end up. We didn't really know what we would be doing. Um, we just knew that Kentucky was going to represent Kentucky and to take care of the people in North Carolina. And um, I will tell you that when Kentucky hit North Carolina, it was taken care of. People yeah. just took a big breath and sat back. Uh, I'm not bragging about myself, but I'm going to brag about that team that went. It was a perfect team. It, they were perfectly matched. We went in, we knew what we needed to do. We did it. We played on each other's um, abilities and what each other's strengths were. And we didn't sit around and say, gee, I need somebody to come help me get somebody up. We went and got that person up. We did it. Kentucky will, will always be remembered in North Carolina. Uh, we did you proud. Okay. I digress, I'm sorry. Okay, after a much longer drive because of the storm and rain that uh, Hurricane Florence was uh, sending on up the coast, uh, we finally made it to base camp, which was in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we had to travel these back roads to get to where we were going. And it took us several hours longer because they were club, all the roads were closed and uh, we, we weren't going to drive through water and we didn't really know where we we're going. And did I mention that it was 10 o'clock at night? <laughs> so we wouldn't see where we we're going. And you know what? In the back roads of North Carolina, there's no hotels. So we just kept on with the communication between North Carolina and ourselves. And we finally found um, where we were going. Okay. So we made it, we made it to base camp, base camp was an old Sears store. So all the first responders stayed there. There was about 500 cots in that room, maybe a little bit more. And you can see they're just one right after another. If somebody was snoring, all you had to do was poke them, <laughs> you know, and they'd roll over and we'd go on back to sleep. So our cots were positioned in front of the women's changing room, which everybody used and they slammed the doors and they got up at four in the morning. <laughs> But, you know, we didn't go for comfort. It wasn't the Hilton. So in this shelter, which was base camp, on one side, and you will see they had the kitchen. There's a menu up there, what they had. They served three hot meals a day. And we got there, luckily, after they had stopped serving the MREs, which are those medical um, meals ready yeah, to eat. Yeah, there you go, those meals ready to eat that had like 3,000 calories and you were only supposed to eat one. And they were supposed to make you constipated because they didn't want you to go to the bathroom while you're out in the field. <laughs> you know, and so we're like terrified of this stuff. We're like, we can't eat this stuff. <laughs> you know, so we lived on our apples and our bananas. Okay. So anyway, we, there's a, there's a, a kitchen over here and a rest, a little um, area to sit and eat. And their food wasn't bad. They had oatmeal, they had eggs. You know, I mean, it was cafeteria food, but it was fine. So my other big experience came when I decided I had to go to the bathroom. So on the other side of the store, out in the, uh, let's call it the automotive section, <laughs> they had these porta potties that were about two and a half feet wide, about seven feet tall. And you go in and they, they were smaller than a normal porta potty, but you would go in and do what you needed to do. And when you flushed it, it was like the airline toilet and it goes shh. And it really scared you if you just <laughs> weren't opening the door when you were going in there. But you know, there was about 80 something of those. And at the end of those, there were like 12 sinks, six on each side. And they were about the size of one of these tables. And you were like bumping elbows with the person next to you when you were brushing your teeth. But you know, nobody cared, you know, they just, you, you, you weren't there for comfort. You just did it. So now I know you're all wondering, well, what about showers? You had to take a shower while you were there. Well, no, you didn't. But <laughs> lucky for us, we did get to take a shower. So we went through layaway 
and out the back of the store, <laughs> and there were these, what they look like to me, they're called shower pods, and it looked like a semi-truck just dropped off its trailer, and you went in the door, and there were like 12 showers on this side, and 12 showers on this side, and this was the woman's, and the men's had one just like it, and you go into this little changing area, pull, this, pull the curtain, change, went into the shower, pulled the curtain, took a shower, came back out, it was really tiny, but you know what, it was hot water, you could take a shower. We were, we were loving it. What an adventure. Okay. Um, What's that list there on that, the picture on the art The menu. I think it's the menu. menu. Oh, is it the menu? And it tells you when it's open, when, when the, uh, rest, the restaurant was open. Um, okay, so you see the, the little poles that are coming down in the center. So if you ever get sent to a shelter, you need to find one of those poles because then you can plug your phone in, okay? And take an extension cord because you're going to have several people that want to plug their phone in with you. So, um, and that was the general needs shelter, or is that? No, that's not a shelter. That's base camp. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the Hilton. That's yeah. base camp gotcha. right there. Yeah. So all the first responders go there. The National Guard was there. Um, somebody slammed the door coming out of the dressing room at four in the morning and they stopped right by the head of my cot in my space and started having a conversation. So I just flipped the cover over my head, back over my head and said, do you really have to talk right here? And I think I scared that butt <laughs> to death. He jumped three feet, his eyes were this big. And I was like, it's okay, just move on. So he's like, sorry, ma'am, appreciate it. Yeah. So anyway, um, Let's move on to slide seven. Okay, so midday, we spent the night, and then midday of the next day, we received orders uh, to go to a shelter in Columbus County. So about 30 minutes into the drive, uh, we received new orders. And so we had to turn around and head back to uh, Kinston. So uh, one thing I've learned is that nothing is solid, nothing is set in stone, you just go with the flow. And we were, all, we were all glad to do that. So we had to make several U-turns, as I said before, because of the flooding. This is not, this is about three hours away from the beach. So this is the river that is backed up and the dam and, well, the dam's not even in this part of the state, but this is the, how much water fell. So about three hours from the site that the hurricane made landfall, this is what you're seeing. So we had to make several U-turns because of the closing of these flooding and flooding, and we saw a lot, but we didn't see a lot of hurricane damage at this uh, point. So slide eight and nine are just um, some maps that of uh, the area, and Wilmington is is the area about where we ended up. Uh, we actually ended up in Shalote, which is where the red dot is on this one, and then you'll see Ocean Isle Beach right below it. So that's where we ended up. And Ocean Isle Beach was maybe 10 miles down the road. Okay. So imagine our surprise when we got to Kinston, to our destination, that we found out we had to fly into Brunswick County by Black Hawk helicopter. <laughs> yes. So I've never flown on a Black Hawk helicopter. It was pretty interesting. And uh, I will tell you an interesting little side bit on this. One of the ladies has a tracker on her phone of where she is. So her dad called her and said, uh, you might want to slow your driving down a little bit. And she said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're going 117 miles an hour and you're talking on your phone. So you may want to slow that down a little bit. And she said, well, dad, I'm on a phone call. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. Okay. So we were really surprised and, and um, interesting to know that it's a different world with the National Guard. Um, the absolute follow orders was necessary. They told us, you know, how to stand when the helicopter landed. Um, they chose which persons went on which helicopters. Uh, we were told to turn our heads, cover our eyes when it landed. And then uh, we had a hot load, which meant the blades never stopped. We had to load while the blades were still turning. So we had to stand in a straight line, head down, arms on the person in front of us. 
and run to the helicopter. You know, do that little in-step thing that they do. Um, and they meant business. They weren't joking. They weren't laughing. They were like, this is how you do it. And, you know, we, we followed perfect because we all got on the helicopters and we all got to fly out. There were two helicopters. So this is some of the pictures that we took from up above. And <clears throat> we still didn't see a lot of tornado damage, but we could see a lot of flooding. The middle picture um, was right after that uh, picture on the screen to your left. And what you can't see in there is that there are homes under the water that we could see. I'll bet, we, I don't know how many miles, but I'm gonna say we flew for about five or six minutes with nothing but trees. So it was a very rural area that we flew over. So hopefully there wasn't that many houses damaged, but um, I'm sure there were there were lots of that were damaged. Okay. Once we got inside and got buckled into our um, seats, which is like a complicated harness, you weren't getting out of it. And I might add, I got to ride by the door, and they didn't shut the door until they were up in the air, so it was pretty exciting. It was fun. Um, <laughs> So we landed in a parking lot of a municipal building and then were driven to preparedness headquarters. And there they served us a wonderful supper of mashed potatoes, uh, corn on the cob, a roll, some type of mystery meat and peaches. It was really good. <coughs> Excuse me, we hadn't eaten for hours. Um, so if this is the stop of where we learned where our actual destination would be. They split us they split us into two teams here. There were two high schools um, that needed people. One, uh, well, and at the high schools, we, we had nurses and a logistics person that went with us. The logistics person was an absolute essential need. We could not have done it without them. They completed all the expense reports, the timesheets, the documentation, the pharmacy needs, everything they did. So that allowed the nurses just to do uh, patient care or client care. I'm sorry, we call them clients. So they were client care. Um, so they, they, okay. So they, they divided us up into four nurses and five nurses, and then a logistics person with each, with each team and group one, um, arrived at West Brunswick High School about 11.45 that night. I was group one. Group two, which consisted of the four nurses and the one logistic person, stayed at the preparedness headquarters, and then they were flown out by a sheriff's helicopter the next day to North Brunswick High School. Um, North Brunswick High School had no electricity and no running water and only one generator. So they were working very diligently to close that shelter down and move them to ours, which they did in about two days time, but they couldn't because of the uh, roads were flooded and they couldn't get them out of there. Okay. So, oh, and I, that's what I just said there. Oh, wait, I'm going back, I'm sorry. That was too long. okay. So they closed it after a couple of days and came back. Okay, now we're gonna talk about shelter life. So upon our arrival at West Brunswick High School, um, Angela and I received report, a quick, very quick report, a very quick rundown from one of the nurses who was there. The nurses there were North Carolina public health nurses whose homes were affected also. So when we walked in, they clapped. And we were really afraid they were going to like make us start work right then, which we would have. But I'm really old, and it would have been disastrous for that. But they didn't. Um, she stayed through the night, and or they all stayed through the night, and then in the morning they were gone. So um, they they gave us a quick rundown on the patients and the shelter layout, and then after a good night's sleep on a cot in a hallway with the lights on, 
and the air condition blowing furiously down upon us, we got up the next morning and took full report from North Carolina and watched them run out the door and we took over. Okay, so let me give you a little rundown about how the, it was a high school and how it was set up. This high school had 1,500 students and our part, when we got there, it had gone down from about 900 uh, clients to about 300 clients. So we had about 300 people we were taking care of. Did I mention that's five nurses and one logistics person? And we got it then. Okay, so this just imagine an L shape. And when you walk in the front of the school, which is at the apex of the L where the two, two lines meet, there's a cafeteria over here. This hallway was a general population hallway, but we had uh, one room that we kept for just one family because he did home dialysis and we didn't want any infection uh, chance for anything to get into that room. So that family was in that room. We had another room that had a uh, man with an amputee and um, his mother was with him. Um, she, was, she was a little nervous type just as sweet as could be, just a little nervous. So we, we took very good care of her and him. Um, we had some people that uh, could get up and move around, but just needed a little help with um, um, maybe daily living types of thing, bed bath, that type of thing, because there was no place to take a shower. So then um, in another room was the people all on oxygen. We had them all in one room. So then the general public was in the hallways and in other rooms. We had a couple of people with schizophrenia that were also there. As long as they were on their medications, we were good. So then down the hallway where the nurses were, which was the 400 hallway, we had a health services room, which housed people who um, just needed a little bit more help with their daily living and helped get up and out of bed. And, uh, help to change the clothes if they had any to change into. Um, some people with special needs, wheelchair bound, that type of thing. Then you walked on back and there was a big foyer, like right out here in front of the bathroom. That's where the general public was housed. The general public that needed to be close to a bathroom. Older people, people that were a little, um, needed uh, a little extra time to get to a bathroom. So they were all housed right there. <coughs> Pardon me. Then in the gymnasium was the general public. You were fine. If you were in there, you were fine. And then you went down this little hallway beside the general, the gymnasium. And it was a room that was like a small gym. It was a dance room. It was a whole, they, they offered dance. They have the bar, the mirrors, the, everything. That was the single man. They got to be in there. And then when you went on down that hallway, there was a smaller gymnasium that had all the donations that everybody had donated was in there. Okay, now you have the general layout um, of uh, how everything was. Um, so we divided into shifts. We worked 24 seven. We devised a schedule of where we divided the night shift into two shifts. So, you know, you either slept in the next morning or took a nap the day before. Um, we were on call 24 seven. Um, we did not just take care of the special needs people. We took care of the population. We weren't there just to be nurses for certain people. We were there representing Kentucky and we were going to take the best care of every person that we could. The general public, you know, they were, they were the people who could take care of themselves and didn't have any uh, reason that needed us, but they needed us to listen to them. They needed, they needed our Motrin, they needed our Tylenol, they needed our Tums, you know, they needed a Band-Aid. You know, they just needed somebody to talk to, and we were there for them. Um, our special needs clients, people on oxygen, amputees, dialysis, people who need assistance to remember to take their medications, wheelchair-bound, people who need help with daily activities. Most of these people had 
caregivers at home, but the caregivers could not come with them. We were told later that they were supposed to have caregivers with them, but we were their caregivers and not one complaint. So basically our special needs clients were people with a medical history that could take care of themselves at home, but since they weren't at home, they needed assistance here. Okay, so remember when I mentioned um, just a little bit ago that there were no showers? Well, there were showers, We'll get to, we'll see that in just a minute, but there were no showers for the general public. So those people had been there nine days before we got there. So this is about day 12, no showers, same clothes. Most of them had only the clothes with which they were wearing. You know, it was very fragrant in, in the building. So um, we, the nurses got to looking around and saying, you know, where's the ADA shower? And our Red Cross was like, finally know that we have one. Yes, you've got a school, you've got an ADA shower. We need to find it. It didn't work. So we got it working. And we gave showers. We either put them in the shower or got in the shower with them. What? Not naked. <laughs> we had our, you know, you know, we had our little uniforms on, we'd say over here, but we gave them a bath. We scrubbed them. They were so appreciative. Some of them cried. I don't know if it was the rough scrubbing or just they were so appreciative. <laughs> but they, you know, they were so appreciative of the smallest task that we did. I mean, how hard is it to put somebody in a shower? So they were just, we were just blessed with with the thank yous and the appreciation from these people. So we also ask that the North Carolina bring the pods of the shower pods that were at the North High School that nobody could use over and let them use it here. And so they did. They brought them over and we let the people start taking showers and shifts. We had a much better smelling people. Okay, so here's our shelter life. It was fun and games, yes, we had, we had some fun, but um, it was work too. You will notice in the top right and the bottom right, there's our animal cages. We had animals there. We got to go over at nighttime when everybody went to bed and just pet the kitties and pet the puppies and just kind of relax and take them out for a little walk if they needed to go outside. And it was just a big distressor. It was really nice to have them there. Um, some, some of the animals we had were cats, dogs, parrot, hamster, and we had a sugar glider. It's like a squirrel, flying squirrel, kind of like that. But um, the funny thing was the parrot spoke a foreign language. <laughs> so we didn't want a cracker. <laughs> we couldn't understand it, but it wouldn't eat a cracker. But um, it was speak, it spoke a lot and it spoke in a foreign language. So I'm not sure if it were, uh, if it was what it was saying or what it wanted. But anyway, um, we got snacks sent to us so we could, if we couldn't make lunch times or dinner times or uh, we just needed to eat a little snack of something, we had bananas, apples, that type of thing delivered to us. Were the, the pets, were they the pets of the shelter residents yes. or were they pets who were rescued? No, they didn't know they had shelter them. residents. They were the pets of the shelter residents. And so this, the residents went in throughout the day and took them for walks and stuff and, and could talk to them and play with them, which was a great de-stressor for some of them yeah, to know that they were too, able yeah. to get to their pets. Can I ask something? Yes, ma'am. Are you allowed to take your pet with them? Yes, they, they were mandated. They were mandated to bring the pets. Um, you know, if they were rescued and they had a pet, they brought it. If, if you just left your home and you left your pet there. Yeah. Okay, there's our shower. That's our shower. There was, okay, so if you were not eight feet tall, the shower would go over your head shower over you so you had, to, you had to kind of go around and get clean so the janitorial staff took pity on us and let us use the field house showers so we got to go out there and i don't blame them they didn't know us at first when we first came in and they weren't sure you know 
but once they got to know us, they bent over backwards. We knew where every where the hidden washing machine and dryer were. We knew where other hidden showers were. We knew where the snacks were. I mean, they just showered us with everything. So here's the little area between uh, in the middle of the uh, school had lots of uh, fire ants, lots of frogs out there, some sand, uh, and you'll see the little uh, the little man bodiless man that appeared in our room just for fun. And we got to have a little fun on these trips. Here's some more pictures of just our nurses station and then the National Guard bringing <clears throat> supplies in. Um, yeah, don't get excited that we went on the beach and laid out on the beach because that is not what this is. Well, it is kind of. Okay, Alaska sent three nurses that were going to take our places. So when our shelter went down to 25, um, we moved them to a golf resort and they allowed, before this happened, the day before this happened, they allowed us an hour and a half to just go out and have lunch. So we went out and had lunch and then we went out on the beach. As you can see, we're all in our clothes. We didn't change anything. We just kind of rolled up our pants legs and sat on the beach. So it was just a little bit of, we just needed that little bit of a time at the beach um, where we got our name, Kentucky Air Assault Nurses. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so demobilization, the goal of North Carolina was to turn the shelter over to the Red Cross. So they had three Red Cross people come and they moved this shelter to the golf resort on Monday. Um, and that was when we had our hot wash and our release. So we followed the people over to the golf resort. We waited for them to get in. The Alaska nurses came over after they ate lunch somewhere. And then uh, we were allowed to go. So we went back to the beach because <laughs> we were so close and did our hot wash there. And we got ha we had a very good meeting about what could be done differently. And you can see us eating um, our lunch, some real seafood. So we arrived back on, on uh, September 25th and on the way back, these were the, this was the interstate that was closed because the water was over the road and you can see the sandbags and the concrete barriers and, and you can still see the water is up in some of those neighborhoods. So this, um, our lessons learned, we had many lessons learned about clear roles and responsibilities, situational awareness, teamwork, expecting unexpected, keep daily logs, and just do what you need to do. Keep your, in your realm of your nursing abilities, uh, take care of your patients. And sometimes that, that means bending things a little bit. You know, if they need a clean Band-Aid or something, you don't have a Band-Aid, well then you need to make do with four by fours and that type of thing. You know, you just, you need to keep the whole community in your, uh, in your site as you're working. Um, I just wanted to say one, one last thing is that I believe Kentucky went into those shelters with the mindset that we were there to take care of the population. We listened to their stories. We brought them snacks. We were instrumental in getting their medicines refilled, getting them rides to and from dialysis, a liaison between the doctor and the client. We gave bed baths and showers. We got them clean clothes to wear from the donation center in the gym. We walked their animals when they could not no task was too menial for us to assist. Kentucky nurses made a difference, and eventually these people came to trust us and depend on us to give them the correct information and to make things happen. Each nurse came away from this experience with a new perspective on, on shelter life during a disaster, and we're thankful for DPH for allowing us to go, and we're ready to do this again. North Carolina will never forget the way Kentucky represented with their nurses. And also, um, they offered us uh, psychological help when we came back because it, you will remember this for a long time. And this is my second one. Um, I went to Florida to a, a hospital before several years ago. You don't forget those people. You don't forget those sights. You don't forget those smells. You just, that feeling comes over you. You have to put it behind you. I'm done with them. I have to move on. And uh, thankfully they offered help for people who, who needed that. Yes, yes, absolutely, almost. But it was a wonderful experience. If anybody can sign up for it, I would advise you to. Thank you Thank for allowing you, me Nancy. Share. Would you mind, before I let you go, would you mind to recognize the participants on, on the, web, the local health departments? And I don't know if you'll be able to remember everybody's names, I but know. all 11 people. 
I think I would, you know what, I didn't bring my list. Okay. I th well, you know what? Why Let's you just look at the picture. picture. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you the name. Okay. How about that? Okay. Um, all right. We had Rebecca and we had Rebecca and Rachel and Sandy. Oh, I can't remember names. What okay. health departments can you can uh, there was Hardin Lexington. County, Fayette County, Jefferson County, Hardin County, Bracken County, Bracken County, um, Moorhead, Brown County, Franklin uh, County. Department for Public Health. Public Department Health of Insurance. Mm -hmm. So yep. several local health departments. Um, I do better than that. Yeah. I'm so sorry if you're out there and you went with me and I don't remember your name. <laughs> she put me on the spot. I apologize. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Nancy. You're thank welcome. Thank you so much. Joy. And thank you for uh, the presentation. Thank you for going to North Carolina. You're welcome. Um, I expect to see you on the next one. Yeah, just to, just to reiterate, that was a part of a federal EMAC request, and so you all are aware through your uh, through your ICS training and your shock training about uh, whether there's events that are local events here and you know locally in your community, locally from the statewide perspective, or federal responses which are in uh, different different states, uh, depending on the, the, the type of emergency. And so North Carolina put out a, a request through the EMAC system, um, through region four states and others. And with the American Red Cross, we were able to partner and respond to North Carolina's request in that one, that in those, well, several different areas that where y'all were assigned. So it took a lot of um, preparation, a lot of coordination and communication, and uh, Kentucky was fortunate to be a part of that. So if you ever have any questions or uh, if there's an opportunity, like Nancy said, to uh, participate in the upcoming uh, response effort, whether it's in Kentucky or um, out of state, please, you know, now we've, that's our second response effort. Um, within the last year. And so if you have any questions, uh, particularly from those who have participated in the response or relief efforts, uh, we've got we've got folks who have been there and done that now. And uh, thank you for sharing the personal side of it, Nancy, as far as um, how you all experienced it from your perspective as far as serving. Did Kentucky respond to Michael? Pardon me? Mm, uh, no. Not the State Department. Not the State the Department. Oh, there, so there were. Hospital, but. Oh, did it? So there were several response okay. efforts. Um, you know, I know that faith-based organizations. Uh, I know that there were um, utilities responses. Other probably EM responses restaurants from. Response. Yeah. Pizza places. Oh yeah, restaurants. Yeah. So multiple different types of entities and agencies were able to respond. So just um, in closing here, let's see here. Okay, I just wanted to wrap up and say a couple of thanks and reminders. I think we're running on time and all of the presenters were excellent today. If you were, uh, for whatever reason, unable to join us for the entire webinar, this will be available in the next uh, couple of days uh, for you. Or if you just missed a part of the presentation, um, for example, the, the first part of, of Dr. McKee's presentation, the oral health uh, plans, uh, that her presentation was excellent. You can go back and just watch that part of the archive webcast if you need to. And that's also part of the nursing CEs that were awarded. Dr. McKee's presentation and Benita Decker's presentation were awarded together 1.7 nursing CEs. So if you uh, weren't able to log on or had difficulty or you had a uh, client to see, feel free to go back and uh, review those those two uh, segments for your nursing CEs and the other additional information. 
I did want to remind everybody, especially the uh, everyone, but especially the nurse leaders who are, or the person who's in charge of assuring that all of the nurses in your agency have a an active nursing license, renew their nursing license no later than October 31st at, at midnight. Um, please remember those nurses who may be on maternity leave, who may work in home health or hands, or there might be contract nurses that you may not see every day, um, but they still will need to have an active nursing license. Um, and then be sure to check, you know, October 20. 7th, 28th, 29th, be sure that everybody is ready to go. November 1st is too late to check on your list, you know, your checklist of all your nurse employees in your agency, because if they haven't gotten their nursing license, it's already too late. And so you have to go through the uh, KBN process to get your nursing license renewed and the that a nurse would not be able to practice as a nurse until she has an active license in place. So please go ahead, if you haven't checked or done a, a temperature check or pulse check, whatever you say, uh, for your, your nursing staff to see how they're doing on the nursing license, please go ahead and do that within the next couple of days to make sure everybody's uh, good and ready to go for the next licensure period. Just uh, wanted to mention also from Troy Cunningham, who is the Department for Public Health Influenza Coordinator. Uh, she wasn't able to join us today, but she did want me to reiterate uh, the target populations for uh, the influenza immunization, which Kentucky, uh, <clears throat> we need, we, that's our goal to target and focus and be sure that these vulnerable populations do receive the flu vaccine. Those populations include children, they include pregnant women, uh, healthcare workers, and for individuals who are 65 and older to be sure that they get the high dose of influenza vaccine. In addition, Troy wanted me to remind everyone that I would be sending out uh, through her the weekly influenza update that we submit for our surveillance. And um, so you'll be able to see how Kentucky, what the status is of Kentucky, um, what level we are at, and then what that looks like for Kentucky regarding um, confirmed cases, um, ILI cases, any confirmed deaths related or secondary to uh, influenza. <clears throat> so she sends that information to me, and then I forward that out every every week. So. Uh, we're back in flu season, so you can be looking for that surveillance information once a week now from me. The next public health nursing webinar will be December 13th on a Thursday. Uh, that will be uh, about two weeks before Christmas, and I can't believe it'll be here before you know it. So I hope that date is on your calendar, and uh, we'll be Looking forward to providing more information and more updates for you on December 13th through the webinar. And as soon as this uh, event, this webinar is available through Archive Webcast, I'll be sure to send that information out to you all so you can um, uh, share it with your, with your nursing colleagues. Uh, thanks to everyone, uh, all the nurse leaders and the local health department directors who did allow their APRNs to attend the, this year's conference at my old Kentucky home. We did have um, 80 attendees, uh, participants, and uh, I received a lot of good uh, positive feedback um, from the APRNs. Uh, and so uh, thank you for letting them go when they were able to get their pharmacology uh, requirement in for their KBN licensure renewal, as well as some other CEs that, uh, on topics that were relevant for APR in practice. So with that, I'll go ahead and close. Have a great day. Uh, feel free to call me or contact me if I can do anything to support you in your, in your efforts. And thanks for all that you do for public health. Bye-bye.